All right, thank you so much. Okay, so today we're gonna to be going over um, a number of proposals for Bassett Farms Conservancy. And we're gonna start by giving a little context on where the farm is located. So Bassett Farms is located in a, in a rural setting, hours from major Texas cities. Cossey is the nearest town and it has a population of less than 500 people. The core historical period of the farm was from the 1860s to the 1930s, and that saw great political, economic, um, social, and environmental challenges. Some of the highlights from the period um, and the farm was um, at its peak was the end of the Civil War, the founding of Hopewell Freedom Colony by former slaves. Um, Hopewell was located on what is now the Bassett property the growth and decline of a pottery and brick making industry in nearby Kasi, and the Great Depression, which coincided with soil exhaustion uh, from cotton farming. And that soil exhaustion necessitated a transition to cattle ranching, which is still occurring on the farm today. So this project proposes that the farm will honor the ingenuity, perseverance, and resilience of the former residents of the farm by strengthening connections to the earth Self and others. And it's framed in a past, present, uh, future model. So we will be preserving important history, addressing current community challenges, and preparing the farm to thrive in the future. And we'll go into detail on each of those in the next slides. The plan calls for preservation of the historical farmstead here, creating spaces for education and recreation, and implementing regenerative agricultural practices using intensive rotational grazing. Pedestrian circulation is centered around the historic homestead and the new welcome center. From the parking area here, visitors can head north or south via the trail system, depending on which amenities they would like to access. Healthy active lifestyles will be encouraged by ADA accessible trails that run the length of uh, the developed site from north to south, interactive gardens, several picnic areas, and an area for primitive camping. A trail system to the Hopewell Freedom Colony would be recommended for a later phase of the plan. So looking back to the past, preservation of the original farmstead is going to be key to honoring that history. Here you can see the plan to respectfully integrate the new Welcome Center into the existing historical structures. So two of the existing buildings will be featured on the grounds for the Welcome Center. In moving to today, we can see that some of the greatest challenges the community is facing um, relate to healthcare, healthy food, and exercise opportunities. Falls and Limestone counties experience higher rates of obesity, less access to exercise opportunities in primary care physicians, and more food insecurity than state and national averages. Um, and I should mention that the county line actually runs through this property, so that's why there's two counties mentioned. So to address the ch these challenges, the farm will serve as a gathering spot for community members at all stages of life to learn about and live more healthy, active lifestyles. I don't know why it's making boxes here on my screen. <laughs> I'll get those out of the way. Um, let's see if I can get rid of that. I don't think I can get rid of that highlight. Visitors can arrive at the centrally located parking area from the east or the west. Um, west the west side takes you to Austin just for orientation and this road takes you to nearby Cossie. So most people will begin their visit by heading north from the parking center to the Welcome Center, demonstration gardens and historical home play. They also have the option to head south to accessible picnic grounds um, the writer's retreat or campgrounds further down the trail. Throughout the site, the planting plan is focused on providing an abundance of fruits, vegetables, and herbs, as well as restoring native prairie grasses. So as you can see here, we have several uh, areas for the demonstration orchards. This area here would be for the demonstration kitchen garden. Um, and then even throughout the parking lot, we have uh, food production happening. So moving on to the parking plan, a portion of the parking lot will be paved for ADA accessibility, but the majority of the lot will be finished using GeoGrid. This will give this overflow parking area the effect of a lawn that can serve dual purpose for farmers market, markets and other community events. 
The parking areas were selected to blend into existing conditions, such as this exposed aggregate that will mimic um, the ground conditions of the surrounding area. We've also incorporated historical brick, given the brick and pottery industry in nearby Kasi, um, that will be used to usher visitors from the parking lot through the site. Um, and there is historical brick around the homestead, so the idea would be to blend those together to lead people through the site. Um, let's see. Okay. So moving north from the parking center, um, you will cross this road uh, to enter the Welcome Center area. And on your right, you'll pass the urban vegetable garden, proceed past one of the historical structures. This is a pole barn that will be used to house an indoor outdoor demonstration kitchen. Um, and then proceed past the orchard uh, and berry area until you get to the Welcome Center. So at the Welcome Center, you, as a visitor, you would have access to a lending library, classrooms, and general orientation to the rest of the site. From there, you could choose to proceed along the trail system or further explore the historical homestead. Just a little bit south of that main Welcome Center is where the Writer's Retreat is situated. This is four small writer's residences that are standalone on the eastern edge of the property. That gives them direct access to some private parking, um, while still being connected to the homestead via the trail system. And this allows for uh, privacy again, while still maintaining that connection. The front porch views from the writer's retreat cabins will take advantage of a restored prairie and then a view of the homestead and the rear views will take advantage of the pond and wooded area for privacy. Here you can see how the Welcome Center and gardens will meet the needs of visitors from all stages of life. Um, and have them be encouraged to interact with the gardens and harvest their own produce that will be grown on site. So the programming in the Welcome Center could include things like classes, workshops, and events related to gardening, foraging, cooking, and fitness, all things to support a healthy, active lifestyle. So in this section, you can see the modern Welcome Center um, will be distinct from the historical structures, but will use reclaimed barn wood and weathered iron and other materials to help blend in with the historical structures. The fruit and berry orchard will be placed front and center as you come into the Welcome Center. And then uh, rain gardens on either other side of the Welcome Center will address um, some drainage issues and filter and divert runoff into the nearby creek. And finally, as we look to the future, um, we need to address the years of soil damage caused by the cotton farming to well position the farm to be healthy and successful in the future and to continue to provide for the community. And with this proposal, I suggest we do that by implementing intensive rotational grazing. So properly managed uh, grazing can increase air and water infiltration into the soil and accelerate the growth of perennial grasses. On the spectrum of continuous conventional grazing to intensive rotational grazing, um, the intensive form is, is definitely more labor intensive and more startup costs um, and overall more maintenance costs, but it is um, able to be actually profitable and it has better forage utilization and manure distribution. So hence the reason for this recommendation. So the key to intensive uh, rotational grazing is that it calls for higher densities of cattle, daily cattle movement so that their forage is never grazed more than 50% of its vegetative mass and long periods of pasture rest. So the plan on the upper right shows how much acreage would need to be set aside for daily movement if each of the parcels is rested for a year after grazing. Um, and this example on the, on the bottom right shows if each parcel is allowed to be grazed twice a year, how much land would be set aside. So no magic math here, it's, it's half as much. <laughs> so um, for this particular site, the recommendation would be for a grazing specialist to determine how fast the forage regeneration period is to know how, how often the cattle can graze per year. Um, in precedent sites in West Texas, the pasture was, was rested for a year, um, but this site is a unique place, so that would need to be evaluated. So with that, you can see how we can uh, make investments in health and wellness in amenities, and that will not only help Bassett Farms remember the past and meet the community's needs today, but help it thrive in the future. Thank you.
I guess now it's question time. <laughs> I don't know, Hope and Lindsay, if you have, you're on mute, if you have any questions. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any questions off the bat. Um, I think that your design is really, um, you have a very clear and organized agenda and your drawings are super clear um, and it's easy to kind of pass through them. Um, and I also really like that you looked into kind of, um, I guess, lightly into a scientific approach of the grazing um, and how that would actually affect the whole site. Um, I appreciated some of those diagrams that you had in there. Um, I think what the only thing that's really missing for me is kind of what the experience would feel like to move through there. Um, I think I can visualize a little bit from the plans, but just trying to, um, it would be nice to kind of have a couple of maybe perspectives or something that show that feeling um, and then kind of test your scales that you chose for things like the herb garden or the orchard, um, just to see what that would, would feel like. Maybe it would become something that you meander through a little more um, than such a direct, route through the site. Um, I really liked that you are thinking about the materials as um, a way of kind of bringing in that history of the site. Um, and so I think like the, the content is there, you have the textures and you have the um, materials in this and this interest in the history. Um, so just kind of fleshing that out if you had, you know, more time and <laughs> all of that would be really fascinating to me. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with Lindsay and there, are, so the things that I appreciate the most is the fact that you have a variety of different plant forms from uh, let's say the geometric uh, to the wild or more free form meadow, right? The, uh, which relies on two different types of management. And, uh, and I very much appreciate that. And I agree as well that the experiential portion uh, is not necessarily depicted in the drawings as of yet, uh, but your verbal description talks about and gives us hints about material. Uh, I think uh, as you know, you're drawing to a close this first year of school, uh, my interest is in how you set up the spatial relationships between the homestead, the historic homestead, and the buildings and uh, let's say the program designed landscape that happens around it. And you made some pretty clear decisions, well deliberate decisions, but None of them are conforming to, let's say, an axial or a truly geometric form. So like the visitors' residences, um, the visiting residences um, are, the writers are just off of, right? They're just off axis. Mm -hmm. And they're off axis from the homestead and they're off axis from the water body. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there are plan adjustments that still allow you uh, to have the, let's say, the physical or ground characteristics maintained, but also being very deliberate about where you're citing the visitors, the semi-permanent residents versus um, the homestead. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one. And I think there's some tweaking in terms of the plan or conceptually that it can reflect in your proposal. The second thing that I'm really uh, curious about is the arrival sequence. Mm -hmm. So you, in many ways, you've set yourself up for a challenge because the, you, there are two arrivals. Uh, one from Kos, Kose? Kasi, yes. Kasi, sorry. And one from uh, the Waco area, mm -hmm. All right? So that you come to this point. So hierarchically, how do you actually introduce the people or signal to them through the way in which you've configured the landscape that this is the arrival? Yes, and I can go to that page if you'd like to kind of talk through that. 
Go to so it. I did spend some time thinking about that. And sorry, Evan, I, I you were not on my screen, but I want to definitely hear what you have to say too. I'm getting used sure, to the Zoom format. Um, so hope here on uh, this blow up area of the arrival. So I think. Well, hold this, on. Yes. It's not just there. It's coming right. from the car, right? So right. you're coming from Kossi, you see the homestead and that's your Got visual it. cue. Okay. But when you're coming from Waco. Yes. So the idea here is, and it's hard to see, I didn't call it out in my plan. This dark line here represents a wall. Okay. The idea is that this wall would have um, signage on it, planting around it to indicate that it is an entrance here, heralding you in from this side. So originally, um, at an earlier stage of my design, this was intended to be the main entrance. Um, but as that evolved and I started to shift more towards trying to meet the needs of the Kossi community, I realized I needed to make sure that both sides were really welcome. Probably most of the day-to-day -day traffic is not gonna be special events from larger metro areas, but from the Kossi area. Um, so I, I de-emphasized this being a grand entrance here, since like you said, most people will probably be coming and seeing the homestead is there, they're welcome. But very good points, especially um, one thing I was thinking about was the placement of this parking entry and can zoom in here a little bit. So um, this Kossi brick area will run the length of the parking lot all the way through the Welcome Center. Um, and my hope is that the materials change will help people realize that this is a crossing zone. That these are crossing zones, um, but having it having the placement cross this road is something that, you know, I, I questioned, but ultimately felt like the central location of this parking lot um, and just the, the landform in this area with this being one of the flattest parts of the site that was most conducive to putting this large parking space here. So one of the things that we needed to accommodate in this project was parking for at least 200 people. So um, you may wonder why it was so much parking <laughs> for this no. site. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think addressing parking, you know, is not the most glamorous thing, but it's something that's, if this is going to operate and function, it's a necessary. And so, you know, it did, I did think about the placement of the parking uh, across the county road, um, but, uh, you know, it, I did think about it, but I actually felt that it was probably an appropriate uh, decision, right? As you were beginning, there were certain things that were moving further and further away from the core of the homestead. Um, I think the use of the brick, right? Um, connecting back to Lindsay, it, you know, that is an orientation, a, an orientation technique for direction and destination that happens visually at the, at the body and or the family scale, right? The small group of people. But my bigger question was what was the orientation, right? From the car and from a distance. Mm -hmm. So can it succeed without the sign? Mm -hmm. And is it a cumulative view of the way in which you're deploying uh, the plant material and then managing the plant material that provides views and this destination, and then gives enough of a signal to the to your audience, no matter how large or how small. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so that that's where I was working. But I, I mean, I think it's you know these were interesting points, and I I commend you for addressing the complexity of a two sided ent main entrance. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you so much. Hi, Evan. <laughs> hey, Jenny. Um, I thank you very much. It's very clear. Um, if you can go back one slide, that's more of the, the overview of the site um, that had the roads coming in. So um, I think the point that was being made about the approach was, was valid because um, I think that for me, whether I'm coming from the west or coming from the east, from say the Waco Marlin side or the Kasi side, when you take that final bend before you get to the homestead, you start to see those porch columns emerge through the trees. 
and you you and and that straight sort of line of road in front of the house there's this kind of canopy of trees over that road that's different in character from the other sort of sections of that road in the same way when you come from the west and you cross over that little bridge over the creek and take that final band you start to see the other sort of angle on the house through the bushes and so and it, it kind of lets you know that you've arrived and so from that west I'm not clear on what that wall is but it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, anything that obstructs that view of the house from the road as you sort of come around those bends um, uh, would probably be you know better kind of pushed back maybe a little bit um, really did like the idea that where you've put the parking is where we thought about putting that parking it's sort of close but not directly in front of or adjacent to the historic resources we're able to screen that from the road um, but it's close enough that um, you know depending on whether you're visiting the house or the visitor center or going on a hike it's in a good location I think that um, uh, the use of the different materials um, the road is a gravel road it can be very dusty you know if we had just thinking logistically if there's a, a you know a, a nicer event going on the last thing anyone wants to do is get out of their car and immediately become coated in dust so that is something to think about for us um, in terms of the experience but um, and I really like the idea of those shade trees I mean when you're there in August and it's 102 degrees there is a it gets intensely hot um, those buildings get super hot the cars get real hot and so thinking about shade as a way to mitigate that planting trees whether it's around the the new buildings the cars the rider residences residences um, that is something that's really important just because the sun is relentless for a good three, four, sometimes five months, to, you know, as, as um, climate seems to be changing. Um, but uh, in terms of where you've placed things and thought about the sort of relationships between them, it's very much in line with what we have been thinking. And it's really great to be able to see a clear representation of what that can look like. Um, and so, you know, I just thank you for your effort on that. Thank you, Evan. I appreciate that. I think over here on the, on the with the wall, I appreciate that feedback. It is intended to be a low wall that was um, just maybe four feet high to help uh, filter the water down here to the stream bed. So this functioning as a rain garden, essentially. So, but that that's good feedback that you wouldn't want it to obscure any view. And um, this is also lower in elevation than um, the homestead. So these are one foot contours for anybody that's wondering. Um, and then I definitely appreciate your point on the shade. That's maybe why uh, these, these trees here may seem out of place when most of the vegetation is here on the eastern side of the Welcome Center, but that is intentionally, uh, was intentionally put there to recognize the, how the sun will beat on that western facing part of the visitor center. So. Appreciate that very much. Uh, uh, I wanted to compliment you on the variety of drawings and projections that you elected to include. The plan oblique of the, um, on the, which is my page 13, right, uh, of the Welcome Center really begins mm -hmm. to sort of set up the language of all the different plant material. I think that you know, um, one thing uh, to go back to an earlier point, and I forgot to say it, my apologies, is that if you could have had site sections, which also, right, because I know you said this is a one foot contour and it, it is at this, but if you can actually show how your contemporary intervention is spatially in relationship to the historic, right, then we understand visually what it impacts are mm -hmm. right and that it it does it you know does your work sort of provide a plane over which we can see the homestead or is your strategy to treat it equally or horizontally so uh, i think you know site sections would also help to reinforce your position on the new 
inserted into and around uh, the historic. I think that's a really good point. I, I in, in looking back, I should have continued this section. This section runs the length um, west to east of the new built development, but if I would have continued it on, you would have been able to see the Bassett Homestead, which exactly. is basically right here. Yeah. So this is that low wall on the edge of the rain garden, so you can hopefully see it's lower, but the, the, the other thing is this is a very flat site, sure. so there's maybe five feet elevation change, but right, uh, but yeah, I, I appreciate that point for sure. Yeah, no, I know you're flat, but yeah. <laughs> It, it can, micro topographies could help. Yes, the thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Thanks, Jen. Oh, you're muted, Phoebe. Um, does anyone have any final comments? All right. Well, uh, we'll move to the next. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks. Thank you, Jenny. All right. I think it's me. Um, hey, guys. So I'm gonna just going to go ahead and share my screen. OK, and I'll start. My agenda for the design of the Bassett Farms property is to emphasize the site's heritage as a freedom colony by realigning the site's modern purpose with its historical function as a place for the cultivation of the land and the pursuit of knowledge, skill, and self-sufficiency in the community. To familiarize you guys with the community's needs, Kasi is a small rural town of less than 500 people. Kasi does not have its own school district, so it's students bus to Grossbeck ISD. Kasi also does not have its own main grocery store for that residents must drive to Marlin. For access to retail or dining, residents must travel all the way to Waco and employment opportunities throughout the entire region are well below the national average. So with this in mind, I chose to focus on providing spaces for education, skills training and entertainment on site focusing educational experiences around horticulture, the fine arts, ecology, Texas heritage and agriculture. The primary circulation on site is by the mode of vehicular and pedestrian traffic. Existing roads connect drivers to both the Bassett Homestead and the Freedom Colony. The trail systems vary in length with some intended for cycling or long hikes and some intended for short discovery walks through the woods and the prairies of the property. The trail of most importance is the Sulphur Creek Trail, which connects the Bassett Homestead and Artist Cabins to the Hopewell Community Heritage Center by weaving in and out of the edges of the creek's upland forests. The site is around 1,500 acres with two creeks running across the property's boundary. Primarily, the site land cover is a mix between overgrazed pasture and Texas rangeland, with forests concentrated along the creek corridors. The land management schedule is designed to control the cattle grazing on site, as well as reintroduce fire into this historically disturbance ecology landscape. The property is currently owned by the historic preservation nonprofit organization Preservation Texas and was historically owned by the Bassett family. The Bassett homestead is the existing core of the property where many of the remaining structures and infrastructure is centered. This design builds upon the existing condition by adding parking forest, trails, and the renovation of existing barns to serve as studios in the proposed artist residency program, which would support artists of all media types in their pursuit of inspiration on site. The design also proposes the construction of cabins so artists may comfortably live on site during their residency. Though the Bassett House is the core of the property's infrastructure, this design operates with the understanding that the Hopewell Freedom Colony is the heart of the property's significance in Texas heritage. There are three significant sites on the southwestern corner of the property that contain incredible and tangible remains of the community. They are currently well off path or road with the exception to the church site, which is directly adjacent to the roadway. The design envisions the use of a community heritage center and garden to connect the three geographically disjointed sites.
The design's parking forest, subsistence garden, green roof, and community center building would bring the site into the forefront of the community's awareness and routine, thus increasing the recognition and consideration to the Freedom Colony's important role in both local and national history. Upon arrival to the site, visitors journey into a parking forest embedded within the upland woods of Sulphur Creek. The parking forest is designed to increase access to the site while maintaining the sense of adventure one would achieve from hiking to the site from the Bassett Homestead. From there, they take a path out of the forest and into an open meadow where they are greeted with the view of the Hopewell Community Heritage Center. The center serves the community by providing meeting and event spaces for rent, as well as hosting workshops for residents of all ages with topics ranging from the cultivation of kitchen gardens, the live painting of Texas landscapes, and of course, the exploration of the significant sites of the Hopewell Freedom Colony. The center will also house an exhibition room of the artifacts and information on the Freedom Colony held by Preservation Texas today. The rooftop is sown with a short, root, prairie species, and ornamental grasses, providing visitors and gardeners with an escape from the Texas sun while cooling the community center within. The center will also be the site of a fully productive kitchen garden, serving the cafe on site as well as demonstrating regenerative methods of homegrown food production. The garden is composed of eight different garden beds, which are repeated 10 times across the site. The corners of the garden, shown in black, are solid masonry, serving as seating and play structures. Each bed is scheduled around a single crop type. The selection of these crops are inspired by the subsistence crops traditionally grown in Texas Freedom Colonies, such as cabbage, turnips, beets, peas, and potatoes. This diagram shown shows when these crops would be in season. During the off seasons, these beds demonstrate the use of different cover crops to return nitrogen to the soil, prevent erosion, and feed the soil's microbial ecology. The bed will also be interplanted with perennial herbs and flowers to maintain live roots in the soil at all times. This community center becomes a touch off point for the exploration of the Hopewell sites, which remain off path and undeveloped, thus preserving the experience of discovery and exploration within. Thank you. That's all. Okay, hierarchically, what's the most important part of the whole uh, property? The community center in the garden. What is the most important part of the historical past? The Hopewell Heritage Center. Heritage, sorry. This is Evan. Um, uh, Kara, thank you. That was, um, you know, one of the things I think that's most interesting about what you presented is, is it, it's sort of challenging us to think about how we center the public experience on the site with, um, at, at Hopewell. You know, we naturally think about going to the brick house, the Bassett farmstead, where all the barns and, and, and buildings are, um, uh, but, you know, finding a way to um, really enhance the, the sort of public understanding and access to Hopewell, which is, you know, an incredibly unique site, you know, where you had, you know, African-American emancipated slaves in the 1870s, some of whom were Union veterans, runaway slaves who ran away to join the Union Navy. Um, where they lived and where they're buried. Um, I mean, that is just an incredible story to tell. And that legacy is very important. And, I, and so I like the idea of challenging us um, to think about how we, we center activities there. Um, but I also do think that the value of the totality of the site is that we have both of this white and black history present in one sort of giant landscape that, that's relatively intact. And so that reconstruction era, Texas history, 1870s to say 1920s, um, 
how we balance telling that complete story is important for people to see the contrast between this big two-story brick house with the double, you know, two-story porch and contrast that with the, you know, little one room wooden house and the with the little storage building built out of old railroad ties. I mean, that contrast is so dramatic. And I also like the the contemporary nature of what you've sort of shown us and, and sort of the curve the curvilinear nature of the architecture and the sort of the, the planting, the sort of the life giving aspects of the site um, in its public um, in its public face. It's a useful thing um, um, as well as an educational place. So uh, just very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. I thought I thought that was a really nice presentation um, and a really nice design. I appreciate that you thought immediately about the local community, um, even if it's quite small, just the amenities that they have in that area and how they could use this site um, is really important and, and bringing in the agriculture is great. Um, some of your drawings are really lovely. I loved the um, section of the cabin and how you really talk about or show the soil materials and the roots and um, just the feeling of being there. And I also like this big structure that you've come up with um, that you kind of bring your own organization to the site that's quite separate from the history, even though you are still um, trying to kind of reference the history of a site quite a bit. I think um, I have a little bit of trouble with all of the garden boxes. I mean, I like, I really like the idea and I like the crop rotation. I think that maybe thinking about them being in ground um, or if you're going to have them raised, thinking about kind of the difference in heights that you're having and how that can be a more varied experience. Um, to me, it feels pretty overwhelming right now, um, especially thinking about maintaining all of these. And right. um, I see as a general move, I like it, but I think that you could start to um, make it more nuanced and then um, make it more of its own experience in itself. Um, yeah, I think. Thank you. <laughs> a lovely design though. Okay. Hope you're muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. All right, so I'm in agreement, but I wanna talk, I wanna zoom out and I wanna talk about the whole plan. You know, and I keep moving back and forth between the detail of the community heritage center and the larger plan. So I think I have rested on the larger plan as I look at that um, extensive loop. So what is the physical distance and time that it would take? So it's a combo question uh, to travel from the homestead uh, to the community center. Uh, if you're walking, it's about a mile and a half, I think. Um, and I think that's usually takes people around 25 to a half hour to walk, depending on abilities. Okay. Um, All yeah. right. And, and then I'm going, all right. So that's important to note. So there will be times when it's just the community center, which is the, the focus. And there'll be times when it, you know, time of year, right? When it's the whole continuous loop. My question is this, um, you know, I appreciate the elegant arc and the curve and the way that it's beginning to work itself into the topography, but it's perpendicular to the contours, right, in that area. And I'm also wondering why it is uh, to the south and east, as opposed to the portion of the site that would be north of the parking forest why um, the community center is put there. Yeah, why it's, yeah, why you've put it further down. Um, so um, I chose that space because um, these three sites are right here and I wanted to use the structure as like a, um, 
Amazing. like something that, that spines them together, that connects them all, as well as like just increasing access to them. Um, plus this is a, a nice open area and the whole um, Western side of this road is pretty heavily wooded. And so just to also reduce impact on the site to not try and remove all those woods um, as well. Okay, I would ask you to be then more deliberate with the way in which you were making the direct connections. Okay. Um, I mean, is it equidistant? Is it always in the middle? And then how do you depart from your location to access or to visually access those others, right? The three significant Hopewell sites. And so that's, that's something I would like to read very deliberate in both plan and section. Okay. But I appreciate the instinct behind your decision. Thank but you. that's enough. But here's the issue, right? Then you're going to have a you know a deeper conversation with Evan about proximity to those historic sites, right? So there's this delicate balance that yeah. uh, you're going to have. And goodness gracious, listen to me. You're going to need vehicles, right? Um, to help to maintain the landscape at the community center. So again, there's a hierarchy in terms of circulation and the idea of service and served. And so where is service? Where do you service the building? And where does the service, does, is that what happens on the back end? Which then is what mediates between the community center and the three historic sites? Or does it happen right on the Northern side? And so there are just some subtle things, I think, that uh, start to play some role in the future development of the plan. But as I said, I appreciate the sensibilities behind it. There are just these little tweaks, right, that, that sort of um, are necessary to consider. Next iteration, Kara. Thanks. Well, also considering orientation, the garden beds are on the northern side of the building mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if you're growing crops that's where you would want them to be um, <clears throat> so you know thinking about the shade cast and even modeling the shade cast by the building um, would be an, an important step okay. um, Evan I have a question for you I I'm I'm reading uh, Olmsted's uh, journal as he's traveling across Texas. What was the first uh, Bassett uh, homestead like? Are there any images? Uh... No, what we've, what we've been told, uh, so this area didn't really get developed until the 1850s. Um, before then it was very scattered. Um, the, uh, the Henry Bassett bought the homestead acreage in 1871 uh, okay. from a man who had owned it for about 10 years. And the family story is that there was a one story uh, wood frame or log house um, that was very near where the brick house is located now. Okay. Um, the brick house was built in 1875. So shortly thereafter, um, they started to make these improvements. It, it's probably the only it's the only known brick house from that period that was actually built on a farm or ranch in that area. So it is a, a, a substantial building considering the time and place. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Kara. I okay. just needed to know. <laughs> Thing too, the, the, the points that were being made about the, the sort of the positioning of the actual community center. I think um, just maybe some as a little bit more information. Um, one of the reasons why the Hopewell Freedom Colony was positioned here is that Freedom Colonies were um, generally found along county, county boundaries as far away as possible from the county seat. And that is the case here. The county line runs almost just off this, the screen. Um, they also um, the, the limited opportunities that the African Americans had to buy land, it was usually very marginal land. And so this acreage where they lived on um, these farmsteads 
was known to be very marshy and, and sort of um, laced with little creeks and runoff and, and not very good land for agriculture. And so finding a good sort of flat place um, is going to be along that sort of southern edge of our property and and, and it, because it starts to get pretty sort of questionable as you get closer into the creek, um, the creek proper. Um, so that that is a site consideration. And it, the other thing I like about it too is it, it does screen the adjacent property um, that we don't own. Um, mm. and, and so that sort of screening effect is um, interesting. I mean, when I asked, um, I was thinking north of the creek. Yeah, but that, I mean. North of the creek gets into uh, pasture land that actually wasn't part of Hopewell. So okay. the, the sort of the boundaries of what was Hopewell um, don't go too far to the north of that, that okay. creek. All right, cool. Do we have the plotting for the Hopewell community eventually? We, we have a survey, a site survey that shows all those parcels. Okay, cool. All right, thank you guys. Thank you, Kara. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. <clears throat> All right, next we have Dan. Okay, so you can see this. Great. Uh, sorry, once one second. Okay. So the site is the Bassett Farm. Everyone can hear me, by the way? Good, okay. So the site is the Bassett Farms Conservancy. It is a 1500 acre farm in Cossie, Texas. Uh, it's a 500 person town outside of Waco, Texas, uh, in between Waco and Corsicana. So the area has a history of ecological and human exploitation. So we've heard about this at this point, but there's a legacy of slavery and cotton farming. Uh, and then in recent times, the site has been largely overgrazed by cattle. Uh, and there is, thanks to the stewardship of the Bassett Farms Conservancy, a deep desire uh, and an effort to conserve and engage with the history of the site. Um, so, so what is that story? So when approaching the site and examining its character, uh, the first thing that jumps out to me the most is the Hopewell Colony, which Evan has mentioned how interesting that is. Um, so it's a land at the southern end uh, owned by freed slaves. Uh, and the biggest legacy of that Hopewell Colony is the Hopewell Cemetery which is at the very, very southern tip of the property. And so this place most clearly represents the character and the history um, of the site. Interestingly, the Hopewell Colony is what we know the least about uh, on site. So it means that the story of this space is, has largely been unwritten. And so how do we address this uh, formally and programmatically? Um, so formally, the geometry of the built structures and the paths uh, built on an embedded metaphor in the landscape, uh, which is in an effort to address the past and create a legible and meaningful designed landscape. So the spikiness um, and the sharpness of the landscape is a good metaphor for this pain of the past, both of, of slavery and the hardship of cotton farming uh, on that land. So the gnarled branches of the mesquite and the spiky four inch uh, honey locust uh, are everywhere in the scrubland that dominates the property. Uh, and these forms uh, are ultimately translated in, into a, a zigzag stone path that traverses the main park on site. And so programmatically, the interventions make space to process uh, this landscape. So 
This happens through multiple means. So there's the Hopewell Art Park, uh, which houses the research library uh, and a cafe, um, and as well as the artist residency program. And then there's a rotational grazing program as well. And as far as circulation, there is a trail system that surrounds the site uh, with three main options. So there is a long uh, hike and bike trail that loops around the property. There is a, the agricultural trail, which leads to the center of the rotational grazing hub. Uh, and it also leads to the, um, the Bassett uh, main house as well. Um, and then there is the Hopewell Trail, which goes from the main Welcome Center and Art Park to the Hopewell Cemetery. Uh, and so the, the idea is that the form and the program work together to regenerate the landscape. Uh, so the artist residency program is the primary generator of public facing artwork uh, that deals with or is inspired by Bassett Farms. So this includes not only visual art, but uh, performance, writing and research. The way I have it shown here, it's, it's all sculpture. Um, but that's, that doesn't mean that other types of artists wouldn't be welcome at the um, in the residency program. Um, and so, you know, the land on site is effectively a blank slate for the artists. Um, the rotational grazing, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the rotational grazing program will allow for cattle management that regenerates the soil that's been harmed by cotton farming uh, and overgrazing. And it's ultimately going to help also sequester uh, carbon from the atmosphere. And so the face, so the, the biggest public face of this regeneration of the landscape is the Hopewell Art Park. Uh, it's the most accessible entry to the site. It's, the, it's what welcomes you to the site. Um, that's, it, it houses the library, the artist's workshop, uh, the cafe. And the idea is that it'll be open to the public and uh, that the Hopewell Art Park has the capacity to entertain large groups, hold concerts, cater, uh, Etc. So the site is meant to be both an amenity to the general community as well as a place to visit, um, you know, for people all around Texas, if not the world. Um, now the form of the park is meant to create a contrast between the history of the Hopewell colony and Bassett Farms. Uh, so while foremost, but at the same time, the most important thing is that it's an enjoyable place where people can enjoy time with their family. Uh, exercise, host community events. Um, so bricks excavated from the local mines that make up much of the economy of Kasi line the zigzag path uh, that slices through the tree or orchard. Um, that orchard is composed of Mexican sycamore. Uh, the area inside of the grid will be mown regularly while the outside will be maintained much less, allowing for that free growth of the spiky honey locust and the mesquite that contributes so much to the um, character of the property. Um, there's also a play structure that is on the path uh, with a slide which further serves the community and as an interesting break in the path that elevates the views into the tree canopy um, as well as adds levity to that park program. Uh, back continuing through the orchard to the Hopewell trailhead, uh, visitors can encounter shade structure that uh, as history on the farm, it's a place where you can gather your group before taking the path to the Hopewell Cemetery. So that path is about a mile and a half. So it's a three mile loop. Um, back at the central, back at the central buildings, the, ca the cafe, the artist workshop and the library offer a leisurely space to grab a meal, read about the history of the space and view the works in progress by the resident artists. All right, questions? What's the best drawing to view the relationship between the um, Bassett Plantation buildings um, and your visitor center? The best, oh, but yeah, between the-, best, the Yeah, the best drawing. Yeah, let me, so probably, and I was realizing this as I was going through this. Um, 
what I should have shown here is that the main, uh, the Bassett homestead is right up here. Um, so if you, this is the, this, these are the Bassett homestead and then this is the art park. So they're, they're right next to each other. Okay. Directly across the yes. road. But yes. Geometrically does the square of the maintained area of the art park have any formal relationship to the front or the fences of the Bassett farm? Yes. So that is something that I thought about and I have tried to orient the, um, the orchard so that when you're walking through it, if you're looking <clears throat> to the right, like you, you know, if you were say on this side, walking through, you, you would at some points be able to see all the way through to that homestead. Um, you know, because of the way it's oriented and, and how, you know, you can't see it all the time, but I tried to make it so that you do have that experience where you're seeing lines of trees and then you're seeing the uh, homestead like through those lines as you're going through. And wearing this, is Evan, um, <clears throat> appreciate that very much. Had a very specific question, but also sort of just a general comment is, is one of the, one of the challenges that that we would have is that that where you position, say, the, the the parking area is within the view shed of that pasture from the historic house. So if you're in the historic house looking out across the road, uh, that, that would be what you essentially see. This uh, um, parking area right here. Yes. Okay. And and so the sort of in, in, in my mind, as I've thought about, okay, where would we put parking? The one thing I, I think that, you know, we wouldn't want to be able to see from any of the historic, sort of particularly the house is like the glint of sunshine on the windshields of cars, you know, just right. seeing a row of cars sort of like shining in the, in the field will sort of detract from the overall setting. And because there is so much space, you know, that, that we'd be real careful about where we would position something like that. Um, but um, what, I, what I like the most about what you sort of laid out is the idea that, that we have had, and that is that the, the program that we offer is the work of the site. The sort of, you know, the restoration of the buildings becomes a workshop where people engage and help us do that. The, the research that needs to be done becomes part of a historian in residence. The interpretation using art is I think a valuable way of approaching it because so many of the physical remnants of say Hopewell are gone that telling the story through something physical, a lot of people need that, that physical thing. Using art is a way to do that in a really in a terrific way and having those artist residents residencies, having artists come on site and use the site and its history as the inspiration, that again sort of fits that idea of the program that we offer accomplishing the work of the interpretation. I really like that. <clears throat> Question, you know, specifically Mexican sycamore, you know, as a, as a tree species is not one that we're familiar with there on site. So I'm just curious about that specific choice. Yeah, um, and that's a, that's a great question. So part of the choice for the Mexican sycamore is that it works well with that grid. Um, it is adapted to the climate, um, which is important. It also grows very fast. But as far as the experience of that grid, it's, you know, it's a plane tree. So it sort of has that um, sort of like Parisian feeling of the, of these tree LAs of plane trees, uh, which is part of the reason why I chose it and sort of why I think it works well as sort of this grid that's very rigid that sort of represents the, um, you know, like our imprint on the, on the landscape. Um, it's sort of, I think it works well with, with that. Um, but yeah, there, there is, I was considering some other trees. Um, like I think the cottonwood would be really interesting, but ultimately I just decided that they break so much that it would be like a safety hazard. And like, yeah, I just, decided to scrap that one.
Oh, I do have a question, Evan, about the view shed. So does that mean that you can't develop on that, on this part at all because it's in the view shed or is it? Um... it, it we have to be sensitive to, I mean, not, not certainly by law or anything, but by general okay. practice in a cultural landscape the when you're in that house the view sheds both of and from historic resources is given equal weight okay. so um to the extent that you can minimize um the sort of contemporary and um, um interventions from that uh sort of the direct experience of say standing on the front porch and looking out um you know, in the 1920s, when that site was in its heyday, uh, there really weren't any trees along that road at all either. Um, that is something that has sort of grown up in, in the last sort of 50 to 60 years. Um, so, you know, historically, it would have been wide open completely. The trees are helping to screen, would help to screen something there. But that relationship between, you know, field and farmstead, I think is really important to reinforce. And so, you know, that general area for parking, maybe, you know, where we saw on, um, you know, Jenny's positioning of that is a little, it helps us maintain that view shed, but, but provides that, that same general convenience of that location. Um, this is something we have to be thoughtful about. I would just add to that, that um, it's not just the parking, but also there's a building or so, co a couple buildings there. So while we may find parking or looking at cars to be more um, offensive in some ways than looking at buildings, both are an interruption of the view shed. Um, I do believe the house is sort of a little further to the west um, but the fact that none of that is on your plan indicates that you haven't studied the relationship, um, you know, between what you're proposing and what's existing. Um, and I think also Hope's comment about orientation is really important to kind of understand the orientation of um, the existing buildings, but also the um, other elements that trace the, the land or cr create uh, geometries um, on the site and how um, your um, intervention responds to those geometries is really important. Um, and then consistency, if you go back to the home place plan, consistency in orientation across your plan, I think is something that also could be developed. You know, if you're really trying to contrast the orthogonal um, nature of these rectilinear forms with um, the, uh, the sort of mad zigzagging um, path, uh, you know, I, I think the, those orthogonal forms want to be consistent. Um, and there are inconsistencies. Um, I'm not sure that the parking is at the same orientation. Even the paved parking lot is at exactly the same orientation as the large um, square. Or the overflow parking, you know, it kinks. Um, why? Um, so, you know, even if, even if you have a reasoning for why it kinks, like, oh, I was trying to keep it away from the pond, you're, you're undermining the strength of the diagram um, by doing that. And, and also by sort of giving people a kind of legible and consistent measure um, on the site by which they can um, um, uh, sort of uh, situate themselves physically in space. Uh, I'm in a complete agreement um, with with Phoebe's comments, um, and again, also Evans. But here's the thing, right? So you, this is the way I would enter into it. it you have to be delicate or considerate. Consider you need to give consideration to the uh, the interpretation of the institution right, or the group. 
right? So the landscape interpretation that's essential here, right? Evan spoke about the fact that the land was cleared. It was the homestead, right? Or when he mentioned earlier how the views of the columns, right, are some on the ports or some of the things that begin to come into view early on. So there are these uh, aspects of interpretation of how um, uh, the group wants you to approach the Bassett Farm. And then you have your intervention of the, uh, let's say, uh, cultural or social in interpretation through art. And that becomes this mediating moment between the plantation home, or excuse me, the farm, the homestead, and the Hopewell community. So is it, do you think of it as a cleansing the palate? Uh, right, or it sets up a whole new threshold as you head toward the hope well. But when you insert that moment in between those two, you can't alter the interpretation of either site. Uh, and so I think that might, that compound, you know, combined with the comments about the geometry and um, the, the fact that it doesn't look as if it has truly nestled itself or sighted itself uh, in that location. You found the right location, but did you insert all of the built elements in such a way that they help to, that they don't compete with the interpretation of the larger whole, right? Yeah, so that's in interesting. I think, you know, that's, that's the careful moment. Yeah, the view shed um, is, is unfortunately not something I had considered um, oh, when citing Dan, this. <laughs> but Dan, what drawing should you have made that would have helped you figure that out? Well, yes, and so I, but I hadn't realized that leaving that field open is potentially more valuable to the preservation of the Bassett homestead like that potentially not developing this area would be. Because the idea is that to have this close by so that you can interact with that homestead. Um, but if that takes away from the way you interact with the homestead, then it's problematic. All right, you know, fair enough. But here's the thing, what drawing should you have anticipated making? If that's your position and you're trying to sell or you're trying to convince your client, that that is an essential that that at that node right direct you know opposite from the homestead that this was an, a significant balance. What was the drawing that you should have produced that would help to reinforce that as you the designer are talking or right, are presenting your work to your client. What's the drawing or two types of drawings that you could have produced. Yeah, I think that, you know, looking at it, it would have been nice to do some sort of experiential section kind of walking through here that gives you that sense of when you're walking through and you're looking and you're seeing the homestead, you're seeing the character of the landscape. I think that would have certainly helped uh, understanding where, yeah. Yeah, experiential, but I think you have to focus on the distance, right, and the elevational relationship, the height difference, right? With your trees in there, with the fences, with the road, right? And all of, I mean, all of that as a whole, right? Positions your project. And so that section would go from the homestead to your intervention, but then also from your intervention down to the Hopewell community. Yeah because you're making the argument that it is this, it's this moment of contemporary interpretation of both situations. Yeah, yeah, I think, I also liked your point about the art sort of mediating the meaning as you move from the, the main area to the, the cemetery. I think that's a really interesting point that I hadn't totally considered. Um, the idea is that the art would respond to the space, but it does sort of fundamentally change the way you experience that cemetery once you get there. Oops. I think, Thanks, Dan. I think what you 
could use is almost like this drawing times 10 of trying different iterations and um, different um, kind of orientations of your geometry. I, I appreciate that you are taking this kind of wild geometry and putting it on the site. But I think then from there, you have to start to kind of like what Hope was saying, push and pull and see, instead of just laying something onto the site, start to see where it just fades into the site, um, where that pathway disappears. Maybe you, I feel like you need to, there's like some sculpting you need to do of it instead of um, just kind of a quick zigzag. Um, but try to, try to walk yourself through that experience and see in what ways kind of the history of the site overtakes this geometry. Um, and then in other areas where the geometry really stands out. Um, and to me, kind of an, an issue is if you say that the site is a blank, kind of a blank slate for the art. Um, I think we have to kind of rethink the way that you're looking at the site as more of um, integrating the art or maybe what the moves that you're doing on the landscape are part of the art form itself. Um, and so instead of thinking about kind of placing objects throughout the landscape, you're designing these, these um, mo moments and experience through the landscape. And then maybe you can start thinking about bringing the art objects in from there. Um, but, but kind of taking a step back almost and massaging this plan a bit, I think would be super helpful. Just especially for us to understand what exactly is going on. I think you do have some really interesting drawing, like the way that you're drawing, you're experimenting with a lot of textures and that's really nice. Um, and I think like graphically, this is an interesting drawing. It just needs to be worked into a bit. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Evan, real quick, final, just, just two things that I've been thinking about. One is, I guess, when I was talking about the parking, I wasn't clear from the drawing where the buildings were. So um, you had some renderings of some buildings, but I wasn't clear on the plan precisely where where they are um, on okay. the drawing. Yeah. So this is the back collection of the homestead. And then these are those two buildings. OK. Uh, so they're essentially right across Mm -hmm. the road from each other. Okay. And then the, on the, the other thing, and this is a general comment, you know, for everything that we do out there is like on those, those, the pathways that had these very rigid sort of fine points. Um, you know, for us, maintenance of the site, the capacity that we have to maintain the site. I mean, the tools we're working with are, you know, cattle, you know, a giant lawnmower, uh, limited sort of time and, and to be able to, to sort of maintain, when I'm looking at that path, I just think about the maintenance expense and burden of, of keeping that how it needs to be to, to sort of um, deliver on what you've envisioned is, is going to tax us, you know. And so the, the, the more for us that we can work with the, the landscape to kind of let it kind of grow wild as, as you know, and, and without really impacting the design, I, I, I would be afraid that, that without a lot of maintenance that that would lose its, its impact. And um, are you talking about the, the zigzag path specifically? Exactly. Yeah, I'm pointing at my screen like you can see it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's, that's just sort of what I'm thinking about. Yeah, and I did try and think about that a little bit because I think maintenance is extremely important. Um, and uh, I mean, my thought was that you would have these bricks that you would, that would really just be placed on the ground and, and you wouldn't need to, you know, you don't need to mow them because they're, they're bricks. And so I was envisioning it hopefully being low maintenance, um, because these areas, you know, are unmowed. And so the only spot is that you're mowing is this, 
um, square. But I don't know if there, there's probably other complications. Like, I think, I mean, I think making a point with bricks is going to be a little bit difficult as well. Yeah, I think that's, you know, maybe the larger issue is like fighting the material. You know, bricks aren't triangular. Uh, when you get into little slivers, you know, it's just you're fighting the material. Um, but I think it brings up for me a larger issue which is this translation of your original idea, right? That, that there's some kind of, that, that spiky is a translation of, um, you know, degradation of land, extractive practices, um, uh, violence against people. Um, and I think that, you know, as designers, we have we find inspiration, um, formal inspiration, and translate ideas into form in many different ways. Um, and I don't necessarily have a problem with with taking inspiration um, like that um, from an idea, but but I think if you if your expectation is that that is somehow going to be a reading that people who come to the site also share, um, I think it's mistaken. Um, and so in the end, what you're left with, despite your original inspiration is the physical experience that you're creating, the way that your design is um, asking materials to perform, um, the way that your design is asking clients to, to manage the forms, as Evan pointed out. And so, uh, you know, sometimes you need to be flexible enough to revisit your original translation and, and see how you could manifest it differently. Um, and for me, the, the, triangula the triangular points of this path um, are, are inconvenient um, and not necessary. Um, and I, I think that this sort of movement across the square, um, I actually think the carving out of this space as a kind of um, perfect form is a beautiful idea, but how you trespass that perfect form um, could happen in a number of different ways. Um, but it really, if you, if, you, if you look at this objectively, you can see that it, it was this original um, idea that you had that locked you into this form. And you opened your project by talking about how um, you, you mentioned in your opening statement that this, this experience you had of this landscape as spiky was translated into a zigzag path. And I think that diminishes the history of the site <clears throat> to kind of a simplistic, um, relationship. Um, and you have a much more complex understanding, of course, of that history. Um, but, you know, I, I, this, this is some, this is like a place I think where we, we sort of um, differ in our, in, in our ideas about design. Um, and I, I respect, you know, everything that you've done here. Um, but, you know, to, to understand I, I just encourage you to, to sort of once you once you move beyond the in, it, the original point of inspiration to try and look at what you've done um, in a more objective way um, and see like okay there are these these paths that get thicker and thinner they you know what is it what is it really doing it's compressing it's the space between these roots are are getting like uncomfortably close. What's the experience for people going to be as they traverse the site? You know, um, sort of all of a sudden moving amongst other people. I mean, that that's kind of a really interesting experience. And then to evaluate it objectively and say, okay, is this the only form, or can what are the what are the you know ten different ways I could actually create the same experience or the same diagram? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, I think. Like we definitely, I, when I told you that I was really into postmodernism, that was like a, a fun conversation. 
And I've been reading a lot about Charles Jenks. And so a lot of the ideas were sort of trying to figure out multiple ways of meaning. But I, I see, and I see what you mean there. Sort of the zigzag maybe simplifies it like too much and makes it seem like that's the only thing there, um, which which is not really what I what I want. Um, and the, the idea is that it, you know it is still a, it, like that it's foremost a place that you want to exist in, um, but there are you know and and the idea is not that you would need to know all of this stuff to enjoy it, but that as much meaning as you can put into it will give it some form of, of poetic richness, which was the, the idea. I think it need, there's certainly tweaking that could be done. Dan, your critics have been extremely supportive and polite. There's a lot more than a little tweaking. <laughs> right? Yes. Because, sure. I mean, look, you, you, you know, you, you have not You've not chosen a simple solution, right? Um, I think there was a, there's a lot of intentions and goals that you had for the design to accomplish, but there are you have to then identify what are those when you are self evaluating the work. What are the questions that are necessary for you to ask? And then what are the design? What are the drawings models? Um, that you then develop in order to interrogate or ask, answer those questions. And one thing I think you, you know, that Lindsay was elegantly trying to encourage you to do when she talked about, you know, drawing into it or working into the site, it's where the path, the grading of the wreck of your square and all of those elements begin to make adjustments due to the conditions of the site. And those are both physical as well as cultural and social. And there are points where this is at the moment just a diagram. But if that's your intention to just build a diagram, then we can critique it on that front. But I think every one of the people who's been giving you feedback right now is asking you to move beyond the diagram of the idea and now begin to develop it in such a way that it needs to change in relationship to material, in relationship to site, and in relationship to cultural interpretation. Then, even though you're applying a postmodern frame, you are still addressing all the things that are essential to the discipline, especially in landscape. But if your position is I'm clearing the site, history be damned, then you then you better then you are you need to defend that. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, thank you for your work and for forcing the thoughts, forcing the thoughts, the thinking. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for the the thoughts as well. Well, thank, thank you, Dan. Dan. Wonderful work. Thanks, y'all. When we have our artists in residency, I hope you're one of our first uh, artists in residence and see what you come up with. <laughs> thank you, Evan. <laughs> GB, I'm just gonna grab some water and be right back if that's all right. Okay, great. Yeah, we can take a five minute break. Um, we're halfway through the morning, so making good time. So why don't we um, reconvene at 1145? Okay. All right, sorry about that, I was on mute. <laughs> um, so first of all, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to full screen. Okay, so this plan for Bassett uh, Farms envisions a site of healing within a scarred landscape through four key elements. The Hopewell Living Memorial, Creek Restoration through phytoremediation bans, the introduction of a silvopasture system, and a public-facing community farm and market. So we're starting out today uh, in the Living Memorial at Hopewell Cemetery 
a historic and active cemetery located in the heart of the Hopewell Freedom Colony, a community formed by formerly enslaved people on the site and developed in the decades after the Civil War. So in this image, we're actually standing in the cemetery looking towards uh, a tree-lined path um, and meadow that's been added. The design here typifies the overall strategies for the place. New additions were woven into the existing fabric and plants were chosen to complement the existing and enhance the existing palette with a focus on beneficial species, including nitrogen fixer fixers and grasses with soil stabilizing roots. Visitors to the living memorial will follow a honey mesquite lined path around the cemetery site, which is separated from the cemetery itself by a fragrant honeysuckle covered fence and planted meadow. The overall plan for the site was informed by some key historic findings, notably Kasi's location uh, at the center of extractive practices over history, including soil degrading, cotton farming and oil dracking and drilling and fracking. Um, this seems something key to note as when the site was uh, donated, uh, the family specifically asked that gravel mining and similar practices not take place on site. In addition, Hopewell offers an opportunity to center black history, which is important given the fact that only 2% of national historic landmarks uh, honor African-American history. There is one such site in the two county region Booker T. Washington Emancip Emancipation Park near Mejia. Um, but it's important to also note that that site is less than five miles away from the Confederate Union uh, reunion grounds. Uh, so there is kind of a conflict built into the relationship between those sites. Again, this presents a really exciting opportunity to bring such stories to the Hopewell site. So in the plan, this the very forms that damage the earth are transformed into regenerative approaches in a model carbon farm. Rows of cotton become rows in a silvopasture uh, system, while the fractured forms of fracking are translated into soil stabilizing riparian buffer that extracts toxic chemicals from the ground. And here's a look at some of the plantings and how they're integrated with the existing trees on site and the plan for the uh, creek restoration and phytoremediation bands that will surround it. The design also transforms the Bassett Farms home place into a regional front porch and people's farm that trades extractive economic models for a community focused community led model of equitable agriculture and business development. So you can see there's a community farm and community market along with the library and welcome center um, near the home place, uh, the artists and writers cabins um, and an arena, which is an area that responds to the residents' requests for a space to host uh, rodeos. New meandering paths here and here and here were added to complement the existing paths which have been worn into the earth over time like a ghostly res uh, presence from the past, past, and you can see those throughout the site. The silver pasture plan combines pecan production with pollinating fruit trees with existing species integrated into the grid. Uh, the two row system with pecans, pecans and then uh, uh, flowering trees on the paired row um, is a flexible strategy that some farmers use uh, to attract visitor interest over the course of the year by putting in some kind of show stopping uh, flowering plants or flowering trees and things like that. Another key element is the uh, channel restoration of the creek, um, which is combined with phytoremediation bands. Um, this is the one area where plants were chosen specifically for function um, rather than to any uh, to than a relationship to existing plants on the site. Uh, so these are super accumulators like vetiver and pateras ferns, uh, which pull arsenic from the ground. Um, arsenic is one chemical that has been found on the site. Um, while willow species pull 
uh, TPH, which is total petroleum hydrocarbons from the ground. Um, theoretically, these fast-growing plants can be used to mine the petroleum pollution um, in amounts that could hypothetically be sold back to the gas companies. Um, in addition, the current banks are incised and the ephemeral creek does flood, causing further erosion. With that in mind, the slope will be regraded uh, to transform a poorly functioning uh, bottomland forest into a more purposeful wetland habit. Hab um, okay. And here we're looking at the uh, site of the Hope Walt Church. Um, this is something that I would encourage uh, the Conservancy to consider um, acquiring as it's an important part of the Hope Walt story. Uh, the plan here was inspired by something that we saw on the cemetery site, which is um, plantings of irises that marked specific grave sites and other important areas. Um, so these areas in the living memorial are um, wide swaths of single planting types that mark areas of importance. And here in the um, former church site, a new building um, structure evokes the former uh, church itself and could be grown and covered with vines like honeysuckle. And then back to the cemetery uh, where a new path um, inspired or that takes off from one of the existing paths uh, circles the site. It is ringed by two rows of honey mesquite trees. Um, and again, it separates it from the historic cemetery itself. Um, the idea that that's something that's that's personal to the families and not a tourist attraction, although people will be able to walk around uh, the path itself. And here we are uh, back in the cemetery and looking at the original cemetery, the meadow, the wall, and the path. Heather, I'm going to steal a phrase that you used that I liked, and that was the idea of the site being a regional front porch. I really like that. Um, and I appreciated the, the comprehensiveness of what you've laid out. Um, a couple of things that, that struck me, and then I'll step back, um, but was I liked how you, you, you took the idea of the mesquite that we think of as being somewhat of a problem, an invasive uh, uh, you know, tree and kind of using it kind of purposely. Um, that, you know, that, that I like that idea. The, um, <clears throat> um, and also thinking about <clears throat> for us, you know, in terms of sustainability, it's not just what we can, you know, um, uh, there, there's a lot of money that's involved in keeping a place like this going and um, making sure that it has a seasonal appeal. Uh, you thinking about, you know, uh, different, <clears throat> species of trees and things that might be blooming at different times of year. I mean, that's really important to be thinking about how can we continue to generate interest in, in having people come out for different programs and activities throughout the year. That's, that's really important. And I will say too, we didn't, I know we didn't talk about this when y'all were out there, but um, you know, one of the Hopewell descendants um, uh, brought up the idea of building some sort of structure on the site of the old church. And so that is a very um, interesting idea. And I think it's one that would um, have legitimacy um, and, and may actually be an executable idea down the road. Um, so I appreciated seeing that, that brought into, uh, into the discussion. Um, and then the last thing I'll point out is I, I appreciated that you had looked at um, the sites in Mahaya um, and thinking about how this relates to those other places um, and how we might fill a gap or supplement those or contrast with those. Um, uh, I did appreciate that as well. So, so thank you, Heather. Thank you. Um, I concur with, with Evan on how deeply thoughtful uh, some of the elements that you elected to highlight are, I want to know more about the ghost paths. You know, I feel in many, well, of course, um, that 
to be able to witness or to see the drawings in person would have a very different effect than seeing them so reduced here on the screen. I think the integration of um, your designed paths with the ghost paths, the traces of history, as you have uh, called them, and the way in which that you're layering in the, the vegetation, I think is uh, um, extremely thoughtful and poetic. Thank you, Hope. I, uh, to the point where I wish you had another couple of months because I want to be in the places now. I think your representation choices uh, in terms of the deep sections with the root structure, the ghost of the church structure, those things, each one of those drawings helps to, and your representation palette helps to reinforce that sort of that sense of a myth in history. I, I, I commend you on that. I, I want to know more about the FIHO um, and the potential sources. What is the source of the pollution that is here and what, to what extent is its influence on the health of the place? And so I'm, now here's the thing, not, is it a, I want to ensure that it's not a small, it's not a, a feature of the design proposal, which only occupies a very brief period of time, mm -hmm. but that due to the, the nature of the intervention, the regrading of the, of the creek slope, right, or the shape, right, starts to have greater impacts, or does it do its work, and then it then becomes a succession landscape, and the slopes slump and be you know take on their 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 natural morphology yeah um so there's a couple different things uh going on here the first is um you know with these really incised um slopes a lot which have really large trees just teetering on the edge um they needed to be addressed no matter what i feel like um so i think creating that wetland space is, is something that is an opportunity um, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the um, severity or, or depth of these pollutants, that is something I would like, need to look into more. Um, I do know that arsenic um, is something that specifically has been found um, on the site um, where the um, TPH and BTEX, the, the petroleum issues, um, are something that that's found throughout the county. And then that's a direct result of the, um, the wide variety of, of extraction going on. Um, so yeah, definitely something I need to look into more. Um, what I like about these plants is that they kind of function on both of those levels. So um, vetiver is something with, with super long roots. Um, it can stabilize even really um, steep slopes. Um, so that's something that even if you know, the arsenic is able to be completely remediated or removed, um, it's still gonna be doing important work on the site. Um, but yeah, it is something that, that could translate um, with the addition of more um, local native species over time too. I very much agree with what's been said. Um, I think your presentation you gave a really nice introduction and a clear presentation. Um, and you um, explained the need for this larger, uh, or the larger need for this um, site to be preserved as a cultural heritage site, which is important. And I don't think we've heard quite as much about yet. Um, I also agree with Hope that you have a lot of cool potential with the, um, thinking about the fighter remediation and the creek restoration in terms of thinking further into the future than some of the other projects today, um, which is exciting. So I think if you were able to keep moving with this project, um, starting to think about phasing and how this would kind of shift around the site would be really interesting if you're having pockets of intense fighter remediation um, in which case there'd probably be quite a bit of maintenance that's happening in those areas. And then if that starts to open up the land 
um, for more cultural uses or pathways to move through. Um, and so it would be neat to start to see like some, some maybe larger site diagrams of the way that these processes are functioning on site over time. And over, I mean, what's really nice is that your project is looking quite far back into the history. Um, and I think it has the potential to look quite far forward as well. Um, overall, I think it was a really nice, nice presentation. Thank you, Lindsay. On that issue of, of, of say polluted sites um, and, and the oil extraction that Kasi was um, had a, a gusher that was discovered in 1922, 10,000 barrels a day for several days. Um, and the Bassett property was just over the line from that well. And so from 1922 through the 1980s, the family made numerous efforts to engage um, oil exploration companies to dig test wells, none of which have produced, but there are at least five to six of those sites scattered across the property. And uh, the potential for contaminants there um, would be fairly high considering what they were trying to do, even though they weren't producing, they may have had some sort of um, impact. And just, we hadn't really, I hadn't really thought about using um, you know, vegetation as a way to address the, uh, that potential. And so because the site is so large and, and our implementation of any idea is going to be phased, what I like about this is the idea that as we encounter a site that might be polluted, we would then have a strategy that we could deploy to deal with that. And, and then think about how we can use that vegetative approach to actually interpret that site. You know, how do you interpret the site of a former oil well and make that visible um, and, and maybe a positive rather than a negative on the landscape? Um, you know, there's some creativity that can be applied there, um, you know, as we, as we discover those sites. So I appreciated that. I think um, one thing I just want to mention, Heather, um, uh, again, I'll, I'll join in on the, um, the positive expression of um, the strength of your presentation um, and ideas. Um, I think like you've been able to synthesize um, history and contemporary context in a way that's really um, creative and outstanding. Um, with the, Im the image that is up on the, the drawings that are up on the screen right now, um, uh, make me wonder about the possibilities um, for, um, for this uh, channel, the design, redesign of the channel. And as you've presented it with this sort of maximum proposed slope and the way that you're drawing these angles, um, it feels um, engineered to me or a kind of um, tactic that's really related to um, uh, strategy of ecological restoration um, or hydrological restoration. Um, but when I think about what it would mean to regrade the channel, um, of course, it wouldn't be a uniform, a uniform slope. It would be a changing, shifting slope. Um, and you know, to to define the meander and um, the hydrology in a way that would really work um, in terms of flow and volume um, would require variability. Um, of that slope, variability in the width um, of the channel. And so I think there's a really exciting opportunity to connect the sort of engineering of the channel with human experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where does it widen out? And, and then what does that, how does that change human experience of the site in that place? Um, 
you know, and, and the shapes and forms um, actually are probably quite soft. Um, the ones that you're seeking, seeking to create, whereas right now it feels like a very vertic vertical incision, mm -hmm. um, this sort of jagged cut um, in the land through which water travels rapidly at times. Um, and to think about what it means to soften and push back that slope to widen out and slow the flow of water at certain places in the site where people might be traveling through or walking or, or sort of experiencing the history or even conducting research, um, you know, related to the, the presence of students and um, academics um, or historians, um, you know, that you could really choreograph um, the flow of water um, in conjunction with the, um, I think Lindsay used a great term, like the cultural use mm -hmm. um, of, of the landscape. Yeah, that's definitely something that, that I'd like to look into more. Something else that came up that I wasn't able uh, to draw yet um, is kind of how it changes over time. So with this particular system, with the vetiver planet, um, roughly on the contours, it would eventually uh, develop a sort of slight terracing. Um, so those are some things that I'm, I'm interested in looking into more. Um, and, and like you said, um, trying to think of a less one, one size fits all solution uh, throughout the space. Heather, on this issue of, of, of channel restoration, you know, one thing that comes to mind is that <clears throat> the extent of the waterways through the property, I mean, we're talking about miles, you know, and so, um, in terms of, of, of some of the damage that has been done to, uh, to the creeks, uh, we've been thinking a lot about the uh, places where the cattle have been crossing the creeks for years without any sort of management, and it's become severely eroded there. And what we find is because this creek is largely filled with water when we have heavy rains, it fills up rapidly and it moves quickly and it drains fairly quickly is that those, cre those crossing areas that have been degraded, um, there's a scouring effect that gets worse and worse and worse. And even in the last five to six years, you're talking about how they've changed, you know, places where we could drive a truck or car through the creek are now impassable even in the, in the little four wheel drive mule. And so <clears throat> for us, I would say that with respect to the creek, a priority would be how we repair the damage where those creek crossings are more so than tackling potentially miles of, 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 of channel restoration. And so, you know, how do we address those areas where, um, where we walk through the creek to go to the big pond, or I think when we went down into the area where the sulfur spring used to be, mm -hmm. you know, how thick and muddy and devegetated, is that a word, uh, it was, and, and just how do we fix that? You know, that would be, very useful in, in the short term for us. Um, that, I see that as our priority with the creek. Um. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the idea of phasing here um, could be really powerful. I mean, with a hydrologic system, which is a continuity, it is hard to achieve um, uh, um, it's hard to achieve something in, on, at specific points, you know, like to, like, how do you address, um, how do you create lasting um, improvement when you're intervening at very specific points um, along something that is, that, that has a kind of continuity and a sort of like, you know, upstream um, uh, or downstream consequence of upstream um, intervention. Um, so I think for a client to see um, how uh, something like that might be phased or um, targeted certain sections, um, but then the need to, to address the hydrolox system as a whole so that those, um, those um, changes that are made um, or the interventions aren't um, then undone mm -hmm. um, in the future.
All right. Any yeah. any last comments? No, thank you for a very interesting and thoughtful way to approach the site, you know, different to things that we had, we'd heard, uh, you know, encountered earlier. Okay, yeah, I want to zoom in on your plan, but, you know, that's another day. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, Thanks Heather. Heather. Okay, Ingrid. Y'all hear me all right? Okay. Can you see my cursor moving? Yes, okay. Years of overgrazing and cotton farming have stripped Bassett Farms soil of nutrients and compacted the cropland. Although the land has clearly suffered, there are existing characteristics of Bassett Farms that should be celebrated. How can we bring renewed programming to the site, replenish the land, while recognizing the existing history, patterns, and natural dynamics there today? Seasonality is nature's inherent programming. Each season brings new sens sens sensory experiences, which are fingerprints to a landscape's dynamics and identities. In our city's environment, we are often detached from the subtleties of these experiences and monocropping and overgrazing eliminates these replenishing cycles. My design agenda is to develop a site that celebrates the transformational power of seasonality through seasonally responsive programming and landscapes to reconnect visitors and the land with the natural forces that give us changing textures, smells, growth and dormancy, life and death. Areas of the landscape offer special interest during particular seasons. Canopies enclose a reveal, flowers bloom, and gathering gardens provide sitters changing seasonal edible, edibles that feed and enclose. The main agricultural areas of interest in my plan are centered around the Bassett homestead to provide a concentrated experience for visitors to understand the different landscapes and the feelings they offer. The proposed design is highly cognizant of existing land features and underutilized attributes. Much of Bassett Farms is considered farmland of statewide importance. A pecan grove is placed in one such area, taking advantage of the soil's potential. A honey locust labyrinth uses an interesting circular patch of rangeland filled with honey locusts, a tree that is viewed as invasive on this landscape, but actually offers numerous benefit for fodder and woodworking. Gathering gardens restore the under canopy of woodland while providing connection with the seasonal sensory displays and existing bands of wood, woodland areas. Trails that lead to the gathering gardens, which weave into the existing, or trails lead to the gathering gardens weaving into the existing landscape. In this swale berm system, visitors are surrounded by edible plantings that provide a people watching canopy platform framed by an adjacent infiltrating rain garden. In this gathering area over here, visitors can picnic next to this shed, which exists on the site today, which has been converted into a greenhouse to feed the adjacent canopy of pecans. The final gathering plan of food forest teaches visitors about seasonal foraging opportunities, including areas of restored woodland and their canopies, and also invite and also enclose the visitors in a green lush landscape. The greater trail leads to the pecan orchard and labyrinth. The structured pecan orchard leads into a wild and untamed honey locust labyrinth. Labyrinth will actually call for more honey locusts to be planted in the existing patch to create an underutilized thicket. Walking through the pecan canopy, a subtle entrance into the honey locust labyrinth is revealed. Entering the labyrinth, visitors will become enveloped in a thorny, dense surrounding, wandering until the center attraction is reached. At the center of the labyrinth is one of the artist retreats. Ideally, the site would be focused on woodworking. The labyrinth edge would be maintained through honey locust harvesting, the woodworks created on display for visitors. The center of the labyrinth would be seasonally revealed as the foliage of the honey locust falls in the wintertime. 
Another area along the border of meadow and woodland offers nestled views out into the restored prairie land with opportunities for wildflower blooms. In celebrating the Hopewell community, I wanted to recognize the beauty of, of that which is created in their circumstances, to recognize the power created at the crossing of their individual lives. What is made when our lives intersect and how does it change through time? Planted evergreen Monterey oaks represent the perpetual presence of the individual Hopewell members. Each tree is surrounded by its own orbit of plantings, with each band representing a different seasonal bloom. As each season comes and goes, a new landscape is created with the blooms intersecting and forming new seasons. And that's that. Okay, Ingrid, I got it. Oh, Lindsay, you wanna go? Go on. Okay, sure, I'll go. <laughs> um, okay, so I think you have a nice clear agenda. I really like the language that you're using um, as you kind of started us out talking about the smells and dormancy um, as well as life and death. I thought all of that is super interesting. Um, I think what is maybe lacking for me is, is I think you have a lot of really nice language, but then some of that um, I'm not quite capturing in the drawings um, and in the form of the design itself. So I, I think that the idea of the labyrinth is really wonderful in order to engage the senses throughout the seasons. I think that's like kind of a, the perfect um, vehicle for that. Um, but then maybe starting to flush out what that form is and, and um, rather than it just being kind of this circular space, maybe it, it um, kind of evolves more into the landscape or, or develops in some different ways. Um, and then some of your drawings, you were using some really great words as you're speaking of them, but just almost, I feel like if you could just work into them a little more, some, some um, I mean, I know you're not supposed to use too much color, but um, maybe texture or some, some um, maybe more things are happening with the topography, I guess just kind of flushing out what that seasonal shift is um, would be helpful. Yeah. yeah, I concur. All right, I think probably plan is your well, making the formal plan drawings that then lead to section is probably not one of your most favorite activities, Ingrid. Um, it's just a guess. Um, yeah. But he, so, but here, so in many ways, like, what can we do to make a, to make a comparison to a prior discussion that we had, and especially with Heather, and we were as we were thinking about the stream banks. Right, so they were presented in such a way that they were invariable. But yet we knew that the situations had to be particularized depending upon where they were in the site. And that to make a grading plan of all of that, right, would have implications throughout the whole area. So think of it in, in those terms, right? You are highly in tune with understory forest experience, the depth between the ground cover and the canopy height, uh, what it means to forage and that kind of experience. So programmatically, the experiential part of the program is highly developed, but yet um, it is never just found. You have to make the drawings right, to communicate to those who are either managing the landscape or building the landscape, how to achieve the effect that you are intending. And so, which forces you, right, to get to the geometry, to be able to describe in plan and section these locations. So you have identified areas of the site that are appropriate for these experiences, but now you need to get down to the fine tune, B 
be able to dimension in place how uh, what that landscape needs to have in order for it to be constructed or maintained. How deep, how thick is the forest in order for it to be visually impenetrable in summer? How many layers of foraging are there? And how do they have a sectional experience? And so I think um, you have to develop the technique for you to be able to take those, ex those deeply rich experiences and transform them so that they can be situated in plan so that we can discuss the plan relationships and relationship to the existing conditions, the cultural interpretation and the the processes of the site. So without having the plan flushed out, you don't have the opportunity to discuss with us what those true spatial and let's say um, interpretation relationships are, right? Because here it's still very general, right? But yeah. otherwise, you know, just like the ghost paths, you know, take me, take me through the honey locust labyrinth. I mean, that the whole sublime of the, the, you know, the big thorns on the honey locust and finally getting to the refuge at the, at the center and the experience of light there. Yeah. Take me there. You know, I look forward to um, becoming more familiar with software and, and, and being able to kind of, yeah, flush out drawings at a better pace because I'm like an infinite well of ideas and it's um, sometimes, yeah, I look forward to not being as frustrated with the, with the process of, you know, impeding me and, and creating what I have in my head. Yeah, I was just gonna say, even with that, maybe, um maybe you don't have to develop a drawing all the way to get some of these ideas across because you can tell that you have some really wonderful ideas and um even where you just like sketched over a plan that was that was helpful and pretty much or sketched over an aerial you know that that got that idea across and so maybe even um letting yourself do a few more quick um, unfinished drawings could be helpful just to get those ideas kind of out on paper and then you can, you know, if you have the time, work into them to be more finished. Yeah, that's great. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm never convinced, uh, like something, some, sometimes something just looks right in plan. Um, and you can understand the horizontal relationships there. Um, but it's hard to convince people without a uh, sort of sectional or axonometric or three-dimensional drawing, um, especially when you're talking about topographic manipulation, <clears throat> but even for like the scale, right? So um, sort of really missing sections, cutting through the berm, um, you know, to convince someone to make a kind of landform manipulation like that um, really requires, um, and, and also for you as a designer, testing, right? To test um, the scale um, of that landform, um, the spatial qualities, the, the space between the contours, is that exactly right? Um, you know, it's like a, fi a finer level of exploration than, than sort of like the first time. Um, same thing with the labyrinth, right? Like what are those, the, the size of the corridor, the size of the, the massing of the trees? Um, and those can be sort of quick sections, but, you know, I had a thought um, a few days ago, it's like, after all these years of practicing as a landscape architect, so someone someone actually today asked me if I like to draw. <laughs> and I just thought, that's what I do. Like landscape architects draw, we make drawings. That's what we make. 
we don't make landscapes. We intend for our drawings to be interpreted as built work, you know, and turned into built work by somebody else, but we actually spend all of our time drawing. We're, we're, we draw. Um, and so, and you make beautiful drawings. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, that's something that you can really embrace. Thanks, Evie. There, I mean, if you look at the plan, and I'm looking at the gathering garden plan, and uh, uh, that, okay, sorry, I have your PDFs on my screen. So I have the gather, but that was okay, go back to your bubbles. But if you look at it, you know, this is one, this is one proposal where the majority of the work is happening uh, north of the road, and that there's a clear banding and a set of quadrants there's a relationship between um, the foraging forest, even a dimensional similarity between the foraging forest, the, uh, the berm and path, and into the honey locust maze, right? There's these really clear bands. But now, right, we are in the point where we want to interrogate further all of those um, spatial relationships, the solid to the void, right, the distant view, and uh, Phoebe's right. I mean, those are the things that we start to see in the section and start to um, understand the relationships or even the potential for interpretation across those distances. Right. Yeah. But yeah. Agree. Yeah. Ingrid, just at a, you know, conceptual level, everything that I'm seeing you lay out here makes me want to say, keep going. Like there's nothing that you've laid out that I would say, hold up, you know, that's, that's not gonna work. I mean, and I think that it's because you're working with what we have um, in a way that um, takes advantage of, of the current situation on the ground. Um, the divisions that you've laid out are sort of responding to what, what's there. Um, you know, I think that as someone who has, has been cut and bled from honey locusts and had to have more tire patches put in the mule from honey locusts to to say go plant more honey locust and i i would say yes you know i love that idea of that of that labyrinth i have walked through that and it and it is the perfect place for that idea but what what's not on this drawing and you're really close to it and i haven't seen it on any of the other drawings um either is you're not showing the pond that's behind the farmstead itself near the house um, where you have that sort of path. There's that smaller pond. And then of course, uh, the much larger pond, that sort of beautiful sheet of water where you have those incredible sunsets from that, from that pond. One of the thing that, things that I enjoy most about taking people on a, on a walk to the big pond that's on that left side of that creek just above where your labyrinth is um, what I'm driving at is it would be great to show that because when I take people on a walk and they go through the creek and you start to come up the hill and they don't really know what they're going to see and then all of a sudden you see this sheet of water, it's a real surprise. And what I like is about the labyrinth on the other side is the idea that you would go through this, this sort of thicket of honey locust and as you come out, you come up and emerge into this beautiful pond, which is really one of the great sort of features of the home place part of the property. So, uh, you know, I think that it's, 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 I like where you're going with this um, and I would wanna see more and there's really nothing I would say hold back, but push further with and just show those ponds and how we would relate those to what you're, what you're trying to do. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I really feel like the ponds on, on site are very special. Um, and unfortunately, I. I did have them show up in one version of this. I must have closed off the layer because I know it's right here. The idea was like there was going to be another trail that kind of walked out. So it was like canopy and then the pond is literally right there. And then there's one over here. But um, really, I wanted to get at that beauty of it from a sectional perspective. Um, and again, it's just, it's just time. And um, I intend to move forward with this project and um, hopefully get, get that across and in, in drawings to come.
All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Ingrid. Good job. Thank you, Ingrid. That's wonderful. Okay, Lida is our final um, presenter of the morning. All right. All right. Does everyone see what I'm working with here? Can you hear me? Awesome. All right. Uh, hello, I'm Lida. Thanks for being here. Um, my vision for Bassett Farm Conservancy is one of diversity. Um, through the systems and design elements that I proposed, I do hope to uh, create a layered diversity, ecologically, socially, and economically. Um, I employ conservation agricultural practices as a means to enhance biodiversity, uh, educate the public, and build community, as well as support the next generation of resilient farmers. Um, the goal here was to develop a paradigm that allows for the integration of agriculture and biodiversity together, um, uh, where people can play a complementary role. Uh, this will be achieved through the addition of multiple polycultural agricultural forms, um, including a native um, pollinator garden and apiary, um, through a demonstration, sorry, at the scale, a demonstration uh, annual vegetable and flower cutting garden, um, orchards, perennial inter orchards with perennial intercropping, um, and then land set aside for rotational grazing. Um, I've also zoned on this site um, land for agricultural lease. Um, because access to affordable farmland is a growing concern to young farming generations. Um, the trail system here is going to act as a link to all the diverse areas of the property and can accommodate bike, horses, and pedestrians. Um, the historical trail winds its way through existing rangeland and wooded, densely wooded riparian zones on its way to the historic uh, Hopewell Cemetery. And then it loops back and ends with a stroll through the orchard. Um, uh, one of the features along this route is a commemorative Iris River Garden. Um, as was mentioned by Heather, I believe, um, there were irises, bearded irises that had naturalized um, in the grave uh, site. And so I wanted to kind of commemorate that through this planting. Um, then the Agriculture and Biodiversity Trail, um, it starts at the Bassett Homestead Core um, and moves through that pollinator and apiary garden, through woodland into a planted wetland, restored prairie, and then back again through the orchard. And this is that grazing land, so you have sort of a view shed and you sort of interact with that there. Um, both trails do have uh, pedestrian-only trails that allow for further exploration and give sh shorter routes. Um, and then most of my design proposals are in this agricultural and biodiversity trail, so I'm going to take you sort of on that journey as my focus. Um, so starting here at the Bassett uh, Core, we have it that's sort of nestled in the proposed orchard. Um, with the Community Education Center right here. Uh, it can be used for gatherings and for educational classes. And then I have it opening up onto sort of a great lawn here that can serve as a flexible space for larger events and for farmers markets. Um, I did want to maintain that historical view shed. Um, so I did tuck the community center into the tree line and kept that lawn here um, because it currently is sort of that short clipped pasture. Um, another agricultural component in this area is the uh, demonstration cutting garden. Um, this is where it was believed there was a kitchen garden at the Bassett Homestead, so I've, I'm uh, proposing to reintegrate that as well as to expand for a little further cultivation, again, outside of that um, core view shed. Um, one last little thing is this existing building here. I proposed it to be a trail map station so that when this center is closed down, 
um, people can still access the site for the day and um, navigate the trails. Um, and just for context, this is that the back side of the Hopewell, or sorry, the um, Bassett Court. So we'll move into the pollinator garden here. Um, we've got kind of two opposing habitats. We've got the cultivated uh, European honeybee apiaries, and then this linear uh, component here is log walls that are stacked um, to act as native pollinator habitat. All of it is set within a restored prairie uh, with sort of a heavier hand on um, spreading wildflower seeds. And then I have proposed a flowering uh, tree grove to the west. We're going to explore that sectionally. So I'll show you first the apiary and uh, flowering grove. Then we'll look uh, north at the log walls and then see them um, as a cross section to understand them spatially um, in between. So here's that flowering grove. Um, we've got the path here, the grove on the left, and then the start of the open prairie and the bees. Um, I propose hun honey mesquite because it blooms from late winter all the way into late fall. Um, the flame lace sumac to bloom for February through April, and then the Mexican plum um, for spring through summer. Then we have the log walls. Um, and here, um, again, I'm proposing, you know, large swaths of orchard and restored prairie land. But, um, so um, one of my thoughts was that any of the trees that might be cleared for that purpose could be uh, repurposed here uh, in this installation. Um, and then I have proposed no formal trails here so that people can um, explore and interact with the log walls freely. However, as the seasons do change, um, you know, as grass, grasses grow taller, that will you definitely change the experience. Um, and there is the option to mow uh, paths within that as well. And here's just a quick section cut of them side uh, from the side, just to kind of see how it would feel um, in between. They're set about 50 feet apart. Um, and then the last component um, of the um, sorry, the last part of the agricultural trail is kind of cool because it's an intersection of multiple ecosystems. Um, so this is that north, uh, northern western tip of the flowering growth, just for a little context. We come through this densely wooded riparian zone and then uh, to that great pond that we've been talking about. And then um, you interact here with the restored prairie land and then have like in that view shed the managed grazing land. Um, Evan had informed us that this pond does, um, does flood during wet season. So I have proposed a wetland planting in this area. Um, it floods out, out this way. And so I've also proposed a raised boardwalk here um, to be able to traverse that area. And then this is also where it's sited the retreat cabins. Um, again, sort of giving them a little nestling against this uh, densely wooded edge, but allowing them that really nice expansive prairie uh, that direction. Um, and then um, we're going to go back in time just for a minute here. This is um, the from our midterm review where we're exploring different agricultural forms. Um, and I was focusing specifically on alley cropping, uh, which is the integration of trees and row cropping. Um, just because they mutually benefit each other, you know, the trees pull nutrients from down low where the crops wouldn't normally be able to access them. You can intercrop or you can plant underneath the trees, excuse me, with like uh, legumes, sort of vetch and clover to fix nitrogen. Um, and then um, in this case, they're doing a uh, nitrogen fixing crop as well. Um, but I've taken from this form um, for my proposal for the orchards. Um, I'm proposing multiple species of fruiting trees, again, so that there's uh, crops that, that come throughout the year. We've got the peaches that you harvest in the summer. You've got Meyer lemons, which have a, a winter crop, and then the apples that have a fall crop. Um, still have the underplanting of like pollinating species and, and legume species like clover and vetch, um, which could be simply mowed for access, um, but are still feeding the soil. Um, and then the major change that I've made is 
instead of an annual cropping, I'm proposing an intercropping of perennial lavender. Um, and the reason for that being that it has long, um, less maintenance long term. And also by uh, reducing the need for tillage, um, you can keep those healthy soils intact and further build carbon in the system. Um, so I guess in conclusion, uh, the overall addition to Bassett Farm property will bring about ecological, uh, economic, and social diversity to the conservancy, making it multi-use and um, get, uh, affording it multiple income generators, and also can serve as a model for new farmers. And it can provide, or it will provide a uh, layered ecological and agricultural zones for education and enjoyment and allow space and opportunities to serve the community by bringing them together for learning and exploration. Thank you. Lida, how, yes. much, how much grading do you anticipate having to do in order to achieve the I guess the breadth of the fields and the more tended garden areas. I mean, yeah, how much grading or how much disturb disturbance are you willing to accept uh, straight out? Phase uh, one. For all of the proposals or? I think as a concept, uh, I think for the whole place. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I will say I, I was going on the fact that most of the site was relatively flat. Um, and so I wasn't really proposing much in the way of grading, um, more just the need to, as far as like management of removing trees and, and kind of long-term management of that kind of process of, of destroying prairies and kind of planting of trees and everything like that for orchards. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I didn't look at how much regrading really would need to be done specifically. You know, I mean, there's flat and then there's uh, farming flat, right? Mm -hmm. there, are local, there are local gradients, right? That mm -hmm. you need to sort of perfect, right? Mm -hmm. In order for the movement of water, right? Um, the, the dimensions of the farm equipment for maintenance, you know, and I have to say, I mean, okay, why did I go to something so specific before talking about the larger project? And it was because of the comprehensive nature and the very, uh, very specific way in which you talked about these specific landscapes within a larger project that I kept looking to see how you had changed the ground to receive all these different plant configurations. And I, and in a way, you know, that even dovetails or segues or, you know, works with some of the comments that I was, you know, um, asking for feedback that I was asking from Ingrid was that I wanted to see where the local, the local change was made uh, in order to accommodate all of the elements that you have here. In the way, in, and in many ways, that comment is part of what precedes the next phase of the projects development, right? And that's where things become maybe not so symmetrical all the time, but actually start to reflect the conditions of the site. Even though it's flat, it's never, nothing's really flat. So I do have a question then on that. So like, for example, in these sections, um, and it may be very perceivable, but like this definitely, this does follow the grade of the land as it's set now, according to the contours that we had access to. So there's just like a minimal sh uh, shift, for example, here and down on this end is the riparian zone. So it is slightly graded that way. And again, I, I didn't change any grading in this area, but I feel like I tried to represent it at least in the apiary or in the pollinator garden section. I do realize in like the orchards that there was need to be some serious um, grading to look at kind of flattening that out for planting. You know, but flattened, but it's also shaped, right? Because how did you want water to drain into this? It potentially, right? Because mm -hmm. you're not going to irrigate this, are you? Uh-uh. 
So, I mean, I think that the, there are local situations, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, and of course, what was I doing? I mean, yeah, your sections have the overall slope of the land. What mm -hmm. I was looking at was in the plan. Okay, more, more within the plan, degrading. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with what, how the representations are made in section. It's starting to see where the boundaries and the limits of your area of intervention are in the plan. Okay, plan grading, got it. And I was looking at the grading as a sign for that, but I mean, I could be wrong. And so the colleagues, my colleagues should say something, but I was trying to understand your limits mm -hmm. and to ensure that you were willing to accept a certain level of disturbance in order to sort of set this landscape into... Mm -hmm motion hope, hope you're right too i think when you look out say out the, at the back side of the farmstead it, it does look generally flat and and when you start to get in it into the landscape there are a lot of there's a lot of undulation places where water has been channeled over time to head down toward that creek um of course that pond that you're looking at right now is dammed on that southwest end to capture water but there are lots of subtle variations across that landscape for mm -hmm. sure um, but they can be worked worked with i mean i think one thing that's clear is that things do grow and i guess one of the questions that that i had was um and you're starting to get there and i'm sorry jane's not on the call right now she's our you know my colleague but resident beekeeper uh she she would love this idea of the of the apiary and the pollinator garden um, of course, I'm always, you know, with my legal background, you know, you know, what about liability people that are allergic to bees, but um, who want to go through this landscape? But uh, I like the idea of starting to work with the wildlife and 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 really this discussion about the the bees. The first time I've heard any mention of the fact that we've got deer and coyote and armadillo and hogs and raccoons and 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 birds, I mean, you can't, you can't go out there and not be struck by all the birds and sort of how we, what we do out there is going to either attract or change the relationship between the landscape and the wildlife that are there. Um, or, you know, is, I don't know this, but it, you know, will a field of lavender attract a certain type of animal who will then eat it all? Um, or, you know, do we, how do we have to respond to the, the wildlife on the property and how we can use that in a way to our advantage. Um, with respect to those cabins, you've oriented them to the west, which is perfect because it captures those that beautiful view. And I like the, that you've been thoughtful about that. Um, the, only, the only thing about those cabins is that the access to water and power to the extent that that would be necessary would be limited. And so presumably those are off grid and that's okay. But, um, you know, we, we, we do have limitations in terms of where the water and the power are coming from. Um, but, you know, whether it's the kitchen garden or this idea of the iris garden, these sort of smaller scale um, ideas are, are, to me, are interesting because it makes a, a very large 2,400 acre landscape accessible to people in a, on a sort of smaller scale, you know, um, you know, that when they come and visit, it's not just big open vistas, but these smaller sort of moments across the landscape that um, will, um, like you say, attract a diversity of people and provide a diversity of opportunities for, for potentially economic development of the site. So thank you. I thank you for what you've done. Thank you so much. Um, I agree with a lot of what Evan just said, I think your project is um, neat in that it's so interactive in terms of the way that humans can experience it, um, but then also wildlife and just materials. I like that you're thinking about the way that you can cut trees in one area and use them for the bee walls in other areas. Um, I was really excited by those walls. I think they seem like a really fun experience to move through. Um, and your drawing of them was really nice. Um, Thank you. The, in terms of what kind of Evan was talking about with the wildlife, it seems like you could use almost 
I don't know if you study like Richard Foreman's diagrams of edges and and um, kind of just the ways that we look at, especially in a lot of your plans, the ways that these boundaries are drawn and then um, different types of edges can create different experiences for animals and people moving across the landscape. Um, it could be neat to take some of these lines that you've um, delineated so clearly and, and try different ways of blurring them. So maybe it's like little, like kind of fingers crisscrossing um, and seeing what happens when you cross, when you kind of get just a little bit of that grazing land into the forest and whatnot. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for that comment. But um, yeah, overall, I thought that your presentation was really clear and your drawings, it was nice that pretty much knew what I was looking at the whole time. Um, that was well done. Thank you. Yeah, um, as far as the wildlife, I, I, I definitely was focusing more on like pollinators and birds and all of that stuff. But I, there was a point where I'd been thinking about like how to keep like cows with different things out of like the orchards and different areas. I was thinking about like ha ha's and things like that, ways that we could keep the visual impact down um, or, you know, like living hedges and things like that um, as again, sort of like an edge thing, right? Where you have habitat for critters along the edge, but also serves as like a dual purpose of keeping creatures in or out. So. Um, I'll definitely look into that and explore that. And thanks for the recommendation on Mr. Foreman. I hadn't heard his name, so thanks. Yeah, and I, I also like um, just looking at this plan, how I think yours is one of the first projects that brings people into that grazing area. Um, and I've kind of been waiting for that. Like what, how do, how do users actually experience um, the one piece of kind of um, cultural heritage that's still gonna going to reoccur on the landscape. So I think that would be another thing to keep mm -hmm. developing if you could. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well great. Thank you, Lida. Thank nice you. work. And um, thank you everyone. Thank you critics for your comments this morning. Um, this concludes um, our schedule for the morning. Um, we're going to take a short break uh, until 1.30 and then we'll resume um, this afternoon. But thank you all really constructive and wonderful, um, helpful comments um, and great work students. Yeah, really nice, nice work all around. Yeah, th th thank you very much for the invitation. Thank yeah. you. It's incredibly like stimulating. Second discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see y'all soon. It was really nice to guys. meet you. Lindsay and Evan, too. Yeah. Yeah, sure you thing. as well. <laughs> great to see you all this morning. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks, Kenya. Have a great afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Do you want us to stay on? Are you like, leaving the meeting open? Like I will be leaving the meeting open. Um, you'll see an image come up on the screen that says we're taking a break. Um, so, uh, but the meeting will be rolling all through the afternoon. Same meeting link. Um, you can stay connected to it and just um, <clears throat> turn your video off. Um, that's fine. Great. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I think we're all here and it's just slightly past 1.30, so um, maybe we can begin. Uh, we have with us this afternoon um, <clears throat> Assistant Professor Maggie Hansen um, and Laura Bryant from Design Workshop. And then uh, continuing on with us from this morning, Evan Thompson from Preservation Texas and also from Preservation Texas, uh, Jane Ashburn. So welcome everybody and um, thank you uh, for being here. Um, the first uh, student who's going to present is Margaret Gallagher.
So Margaret, I believe you should <clears throat> be able to share your screen. You can uh, go ahead and start us off. Uh, just one minute. Okay, everyone should be able to unmute themselves as well now. Hi guys, my name is Margaret Gallagher, uh, and this is my design proposal for Bassett Farms. So the design proposal for Bassett Farms seeks to both honor and learn from the complicated history of the site. Sankofa is a word from the Akan tribe of Ghana that translates to go back and get it, and is commonly used with the proverb, it is not wrong to go back for that which you have forgotten. It represents the need to reflect on the past with critical but thoughtful examination and has also been adopted as an important symbol for the history of African Americans in the United States. It is both a word and a symbol, often represented as a stylized heart shape or by a bird with its head turns backwards while its feet face forward, carrying a precious egg in its mouth. In this design proposal, Sankofa is used as a framework for historical conservation and site design as well as a symbol to honor the African diaspora in the South. By conserving and remembering the site's history, we can then begin to learn from it. The guiding question of our studio is how can Bassett Farms best be developed to serve as a model carbon farm? And our studio conducted site analyses together for our first module of the course. I've included some of my classmates' work on the next few slides. Henry Bassett bought the property in 1869, and in 1871, the Hopewell Freedom Colony was founded nearby by a group of recently freed slaves, with Henry Jefferson and William Morton as the founding members. For the next approximately 80 years, the land of Bassett and Hopewell would be used to farm cotton and raise cattle, both of which, led, both of which have led to soil degradation and compaction. The site is primarily flat, with gentle slopes through the center of the property and steeper slopes found near riverbanks. There is heavy erosion as well as depleted understory layers in the forest and woody encroachment in the prairie. Located near downtown Cossie, Texas, Bassett Farms is split between two eco-regions, the Blackland Prairie and the East Central Texas Plains. The site acts as an important node for migrating species and has the potential to be a large pollinator habitat. It is close to important cultural and historical monuments including the original site of Juneteenth, where on June 19, 1865, the Emancipation Proclamation was read, thus ending slavery in Texas. Bassett Farms is in the center of the Texas Triangle, and the site has the potential to be a travel and educational destination for people in Austin, Houston, and Dallas. I started my design process by making conceptual models, and I kept returning to the image of the site as this complex knot reflecting the interconnected history of everyone who has used the land. In weaving, there are two ends of a thread. The focus is on the cohesive outcome and not the individual transformations and manipulations that create it. And many systems in America function thusly, within a controlled set of parameters and with a promised product. When do we take the time to undo a finished piece just to understand how it was formed? How does such a piece change when put back together by different hands? As landscape architects, our designs are not stagnant. We are constantly adapting with ephemeral beginnings and ends. The natural, the natural world shows us that rigid control breaks. This design bends. The final site design will utilize the complex ecological, agricultural, and historical stories of Bassett Farms to create new forms inspired by the movement, shape, and pattern of woven design that honor the tradition of Sankofa by examining the history through a critical lens. By deconstructing and examining the elements that are present, the design will make space for them to intertwine in new ways. This project will seek to understand the process of intersection, not the product, by reimagining Bassett Farms into a model carbon farm while creating space for reflection on its history. The site design will support educational programming, indoor gatherings, parking, riders retreat accommodations, and hiking trails. There are two trails. The first one is the Hopewell and Bassett Historical Path, which brings visitors from the parking lot to the Bassett Homestead, Visitor Center, Library, and Terrace Farming. This path explores Bassett and Hopewell history, soil degradation and compaction, exploitative farming practices, and regenerative soil models as a solution. It also brings visitors through the forest to the Hopewell Cemetery. 
it's recommended that the farm acquire the neighboring plot that includes the Hopewell Church and Homestead down here at the bottom. If it does, the path can easily be extended to incorporate those sites as well. As a nod to how the Sankofa symbol is a common design on gates and tombstones, the symbol will be featured on the main doors of the library and visitor center, as well as on the trailheads and gates to the Hopewell Cemetery. The reflection trail is a shorter and less difficult trail that connects the rider's cabins to the main area. Brazos Farms is an important watershed for the area and both the Little Brazos River and Sulphur Creek run through the farm. There are three primary planting zones, silvopasture, which is a mix of pasture and forest, restored prairie, and existing forest. The prairie area is an orthogonal shape carved out of the existing land that will be replanted with a mix of grasses, wildflowers, shrubs, and trees. By connecting the existing restoration plots, the prairie will more effectively serve as a habitat for migrating species. The prairie path is a wide 12-foot mown path that sharply contrasts with the six foot narrow path of the dense shady forest. The path takes a larger loop to the Hopewell Cemetery. The area of the site has little changes, in part to, to respect the quiet peacefulness of the area. The main change is the addition of a small walking path through the cemetery, where the forest and native irises provide a backdrop to honor the former residents. There are seven riders' cabins, which are located at the bottom loop of the reflection path. Each has a small wildflower field surrounding it and are connected by a winding set of paths. The upper half of the site will be used for silvopasture, which is the integration of trees and grazing livestock on the same land. Unlike conventional methods, silvopasture improves the health of the livestock, plants, and soils. By limiting where the Hereford cattle at the farm can graze, the pastures and forests are given time to fully regrow, which leads to more productive grazing and improved quality and diversity of forage available. It also sequesters carbon, as pasture and forest plants are able to grow deeper roots and keep carbon in the soil. Currently, cattle have free range of the site, and historically the land that was too degraded for cotton was used for cattle, compounding the heavily compacted soil and poor forage selection. To create a silva pasture at Bassett, the area will be supplemented with plantings of different tree and pasture communities to build on what is currently there. The goal is not to have a uniform pasture or ordered forest, but rather a patchwork. The Hereford, the Hereford cattle will rotate through the area, moving to a different fenced pasture in the region every few days. The map illustrates the general area that will be grazed each season. The visitor center is located by the Bassett House and will have resources and a small historical exhibit to orient visitors to the space. The terrace farming is located at the intersection of the paths connecting the Bassett homestead and historical buildings with the larger trail area. It represents a way for visitors to engage with regenerative farming practices. For much of the farm's history, the flattest area was used for cotton, which requires heavy manipulation of land. Cotton farming is hard on the soil, particularly because it requires tilling or deep plowing, which destroys the topsoil. The Zanja Bordo farming technique used in central Mexico is reimagined for the site to help address soil concerns and aid in carbon sequestration. Here, the form and growth pattern of the agave americana are used to break up compacted soil, prevent erosion, stabilize the planting berms, and capture rainfall. The middle area shows how many terraces can be constructed in six hours based on the type of soil present. So very compacted soil, you'd be able to construct five to 10 meters of the terraces in six hours. Plantings in between the rows are protected and irrigated by a running trench along the front of each agave row. Suggested plantings are corn, beans, squash, and tomatoes. 
The library is adjacent to the terrace farming and serves as a resource on regenerative agricultural practices with a focus on Texas. The terrace farming represents a shift in agrarian understanding that utilizes the topographical subtleties present instead of relying on extractive farming methods. And the shapes formed by the terraces both honor the land as it is while providing ways to engage visitors and improve the ecological health of the site. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Um, thank you. Do you think you could walk us through? Um, I'm curious the kind of choreography of experience. So, and, and because this is, there's so much content uh, for the, you know, occupant, the visitor, can you walk us through kind of the mindset and of what someone is experiencing when they enter, kind of how, how they move through and how that might change upon leaving what that what that exit is as well. Yeah, um, can you guys see the main site plan? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So the idea is that as you are arriving, you're either arriving through the Silva pasture um, or through the prairie. So getting a sense of what the land was once like and the regenerative agricultural practices that are currently being used. The parking is directly below the visitor center and the idea is that you arrive, you go through the visitor center and that really ties into the terrace farming and then visitors are given the option they can either do the longer more difficult trail that connects to help well and brings them through the prairie or they can do the shorter reflective path. And the middle loop is in both trails um, is just a way to further diversify the trail experience. You can have a longer walk, you can have a shorter one. You can do both if you have the time. And how, how does everyone exit? Um, as it's a loop, the idea is that you sort of do the trail as a loop and then um, you leave the same way you came in. I'm realizing, are you referring to the fact that the roads um, cut off a little bit? Uh, no, I'm just genuinely curious. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't um, sure. <laughs> no, that was just like a style choice to keep it focused on the site. But yeah, the idea is that you leave the same way you came in, um, but because there's the silva pasture and the prairie, if you came in through the prairie, you could leave through the silva pasture and vice versa. Um, Margaret, just hearing you describe that, I I'm sure Laura has um, more more questions and more to say about the maybe about the trail experience but just as you were you were describing sort of arrival it um, occurs to me that it's it's interesting that <clears throat> each of the ways into the site which may or may not be heavily used um, you know I, I don't really know about that small road um, cutting through the property uh, from the north um, but that each of these ways in takes you through a very different landscape typology um, or a different aspect of the farm. So we have prairie, you know, that is sort of like one um, uh, kind of um, uh, one experience, right? Driving through a, a prairie um, and, it, and sort of the views that that would give you across the farm, um, moving through the <clears throat> silva pasture, the agricultural silva pasture landscape. Um, coming from Kasi, um, you know, and, and sort of hitting that bend and seeing the home place um, uh, and the historic house. 
um, with maybe the, the terracing in the background. And then coming up from um, along the, um, the Hopewell Road, um, you know, if uh, the church property is um, developed in some way, either by um, the owners of uh, Bassett Farms or um, in collaboration with other partners, um, that, that takes you by Hopewell and could be a very visible sort of marker as you approach the farm. That um, the road that comes in from the, the north through the Silver Pasture is uh, <clears throat> basically a back road that, that it's very little trafficked. Um, the, um, but one of the, the question that I had was um, along the, uh, the road that comes in on the west, you show this, um, the pastures and then the, the Silva pasture and, and sort of the, the layout of it is this sort of like these different fingers that extend into the landscape. And I mean, how would you propose managing the, the, the sort of the edge between those two different landscapes? Um, you know, is this with, with fencing? Is it, is it um, or, or is it just a, a sort of a suggested shape um, and it's sort of a, a looser transition, um, just thinking about how to manage that landscape. Yeah, so for the side that cuts into the silva pasture, that would be fenced. Uh, part of the orthogonal shape was informed by sort of best silva pasture management methods, which um, recommend having smaller, more rectangular areas that you move the cows in between. So that area would be fenced. Um, but that's a great question. I, when I designed this, had imagined both sides being equally fenced for management, but it could be really interesting to explore the second half as sort of like a softer, less rigid form that maybe it's a softer transition to the forest, whereas on the silver pasture side, you have a fence. So yeah, the silver pasture side is definitely fenced. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an opportunity too, to think about, you know, you've got that line cutting through topography. So um, just really understanding what that fence actually might look like. And if there's an opportunity to, you know, be a little bit more responsive to what's happening there. Yeah, I, I mean, Margaret, I, I think you covered a lot of um, information and also a, a really rich set of metaphors in your presentation. And for me, I keep thinking back to the initial image that you showed us of your woven studies and um, both in terms of, I, I love for the woven studies and just the idea of weave to come more strongly into um, the way that you're thinking about a path that weaves through a series of experiences, both historic as well as new um, contemporary management practices, uh, choreographing that as um, a sequence of experiences that has a chance to look forward as well as back. And so I could imagine rather than a loop that there are um, a series of switchbacks that allow you to see similar spaces from different perspectives, right? Um, and, and I think I would love to see the, the circulation here to be um, much more strongly, strongly choreographed so that you are determining where we enter how we move, what we see first, second, third, as a narrative um, that has a series of lessons, right? Um, and that I hope is, is drawing from those really beautiful woven studies uh, that you showed. And I think then the second thing I would say is a question of representation and just the, the rich textures in your woven studies um, and considering ways of representing these different conditions on the site um, through an application of texture that uh, is a little bit more indicative of how the um, 
the systems might overlap and intersect or occupy space adjacent to one another um, with a very hard line uh, so that we can imagine um, transitions between these. And I think um, that's why I was sort of asking about the experience because there's so much of this too, in addition to, I would just agree with all of that, in addition to what is happening within your paths, um, there's also kind of building up to the moment and the compression afterwards. Um, so, you know, once you have experienced this, there's that departure and um, just thinking about how people might be able to, and, and again, how your how you're woven metaphor, what does that look like when it kind of unravels or, um, you know, what, it, what does it look like when it is a, is a knot and um, nodes? And, and I think you could apply Kind of apply some time to that so uh you know like that it's pulled out and it's slow time kind of moves slower and it's faster and um just using all of that work and uh putting it in here to enrich the drawing and the project margaret um had a, a couple of comments and a question. One is I really appreciated seeing that watershed map. I think that's a very useful illustration um, just in general. Um, uh, but the uh, the building that you showed is a, that, that's a great map. I enjoyed seeing that um, um, laid out. Um, the building that you had shown for the, uh, I think one of the writer's cabins, I really appreciated that too. I know that's probably not part of the the, the critique you should be getting, but I really did like it and I wanted to be there. Um, and where you've put those writer's cabins, I mm -hmm. will say that you've chosen what is one of my favorite places to be, that bit of high ground, um, the, there's a bit of a clearing there. And I think it's, it's, it's smart to position writer's cabins away from activity. I think that's sort of the appeal. Um, of the, of the site is that if you're gonna go out there and write, you wanna be somewhat isolated, but not too far, but that, 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 that rectangle on the other side of that creek is really an underappreciated asset. Um, it's very close to the farm, but it's very isolated um, at the same time. And there's a lot of potential there. And I like the idea of trying to enhance, enhance that part of the site by incorporating the, um, the cabins in there. The, the question that I had was where you showed the um, terrace farming. Are you proposing, and maybe I missed this, creating or enhancing terraces, or is that just trying to take advantage of the natural contours that are already there? Um, the way they're shown, that, that looks a lot more dramatic than, than what it, um, how it is in sort of reality. Um, so. Here, yeah, I was, Wondering that too, as I was doing some of these drawings, and I think it might help to maybe explore it on, um, you know, a much smaller scale, like for the, where's my library section cut? For this section cut, you can see it's actually like not a particularly dramatic grade change, which is mm -hmm. why I'm recommending this type of terrace farming. Uh, so the idea is that it's used in areas that are really flat, that have compacted soil and sort of struggle with how to keep water in the site. And so the agave is kind of this like really cool, interesting super plant because it's planted along the contours where you have, you know, very gradual grade change. So the idea is that it's not, you know, this like dramatic land manipulation, that it's actually very subtle and their roots sort of not just like stabilize the berms but they really break down compacted soil and then that allows you to plant sort of in between the contours um, and then the agave act as not just like wind breaks but they also sort of help keep water because they have that trench in the front 
So it, as one of the sort of purposes of the farm is to be an educational resource um, and a demonstration to people, um, not just from around the state that might come to visit and, and, and participate in some programs, but for local um, landowners around, would you propose that this idea of terrace farming and, and the agave be something that that they adopt as well in, in different situations? Or do you see that as something that was just an idea that's unique to this site? I mean, does it have application to a wider audience than just Bassett Farms property? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't touch on this as much before our second module, we explored regenerative farming practices and Zanha Bordo with the agaves was the farming practice that um, I did my project on. But we actually had several people in the studio who ended up, but the terrace farming sort of evolved to like, how can you use terrace farming based on the existing topography of the land and not, we need to build these like really steep terraces and that's the only way you can do it. The idea is that terrace farming is a really successful regenerative agricultural practice that's also very malleable. Um, and so, yeah, the reason I chose this and I chose the plantings that I did is that um, I think it would translate really well for people who are dealing with the same ecological and agricultural issues that Bassett has, which is, you know, like keeping water on site, breaking up compacting soil, and just exploring how you maybe do that without just like coming through with a tractor and just like breaking it all up, how do you actually use plantings um, to sort of get the soil to where you need it to be and be able to have a more successful and productive farm. I think that's interesting. And in the 1930s and 40s in Limestone County, there was an effort to um, implement the idea of terrace farming. And so I think as we move ahead with some of our research, um, it, we can we can look for some of those sites that that where they might have um, tried to do that and see how that has held up um, or if it's continued, you know, some seventy or eighty years later. It's an interesting idea. Thank you, Margaret. I think um, Margaret um, that the idea of terracing just broadly. Um, uh, could be expanded um, in the way that you're developing your project across the site. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think like yours might be a case of too many metaphors. Um, you've got those amazing weaving experiments. Um, and then, but, it, but in addition to that, sort of the idea of weaving and knotting, um, we've got uh, the idea of terracing um, and um, the idea of carving. Um, and where I'm seeing carving is in those prairie um, areas, how the, um, the sort of fingers are being carved um, out of the existing um, wooded landscape. Um, and so I think all of those things are very different actions. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure um, if sort of using or drawing upon them all um, it, like on the one hand, it, it could sort of, you could have a sort of overlay of strategies, right? But there becomes a certain point when there are just too many metaphors and, and how do you, how do you sort of, um, how do you find consistency across your project? Um, terracing is just one example I'll take. Uh, you've thought of it in terms of the terracing, terrace farming, right? As this particular agro -eco ecological uh, management strategy, um, which definitely has application to the site. However, more broadly, the idea of, ter the idea of terracing could be expanded um, across, um, you know, if you, if you think about the different terraces, um, that the, um, the way the program is aggregated on the site in um, kinds of terraces, uh, like the, the home place um, being one of them, um, you know, or um, sort of then expanding across the road to the parking, um, you could maybe find continuity um, throughout so that 
um, the design feels less like a series of isolated interventions and more like um, uh, component parts that are related um, and you start to sort of manipulate and shape the land with one overarching strategy. So I think you might, you know, you, you could also think about the prairie and the silvopasture in terms of the sort of topographically, right? Or in just terms of like a terrace or terracing. If you think about the prairie in those terms, you start to understand those, you know, as Evan described them, fingers quite differently. Um, with the prairie, I think that um, one of the things I find really interesting is um, the form that you've drawn. Um, as a diagram, I think it's really powerful. Um, and I think that it, it, for me, it resonates with what's already there, uh, the restoration plots that have already been completed. They have these very um, prominent sort of boundaries um, between the horizontality of the, of the, of the grassland and then um, the forest that surrounds them. Um, so you see that line very distinctly. Um, but I think that you, what you have drawn is still a diagram and could be massaged further. Um, if you think about that line, um, that there could be great variability in the dimension and scale of those pieces, um, of those edges. Um, and I think it's a it's an area to explore in terms of landscape ecology. You know, how close are these fingers to each other? Um, when you manipulate their shape and form, what does that do to the edge between forest and, and prairie? Um, what does that mean for species moving along or across those edges? Um, and how does that all fit within your, your agenda for Bassett Farms? Margaret, with the <clears throat> with these subtle or maybe more dramatic topography shifts that you're discussing, like the terracing, have you considered the different views that one would experience from the path on the terrace? Um, it just seems like that's an opportunity, uh, a, a really great opportunity for a beautiful view of the property um, or you know, some seating could be incorporated for educational. Um. Yeah, so that's a great point. I had started to explore it with this one, um, but sort of like Evan was saying earlier, like it appears very dramatic and in reality, these contours are farther apart. So yeah, that's an interesting thought, which is like, how do you make this area more engaging um, or like interactive. Um, something I would like to explore further is if you can use this type of terracing with a plant that's maybe has like a different shape and growth pattern than the agave because just the shape of the agave is so like big and sharp, you can't really mm -hmm. like move through and interact with it in the way that you can with like a demonstration garden. So I don't know, I, I would love more feedback on this area. Well, and I think, I think it'd be interesting too, to think about how you experience that from the path. So at what point along the path do you see this terrace and is it something that is a, you know, how, how do your path, what are the terminating views of your paths at different junctures and how can you sort of tease someone along, maybe they get a glimpse, um, but that can be kind of identifying those moments for views um, and destinations and using that to kind of more intricately weave your path network. I think there's also a missing layer here, which is existing trees. Um, if, unless you're proposing to remove everything, there are some large and beautiful specimen trees uh, back in this area. Um, and to, mm -hmm. to think about how one might move up through and past um, large trees, how views might be obscured, 
um, you know, and then opened up um, with the existing or even proposed trees that you could add, um, you know, would would really help in choreographing the kind of experience Laura's describing. Yeah, that shade and views, all those things that kind of get down to the smaller scale of the human body walking along this path and what they're experiencing. Yeah, I think that that through this drawing and this conversation, this is where, you know, perhaps your path doesn't always go perpendicular to um, your planting terraces, but maybe there are moments where it intentionally slips alongside and you're walking on it. Um, and I think that that is probably choreographed alongside the trees that uh, are existing and probably retained here. So you're really thinking about a sequence of experiences. The University of Arkansas put out an interesting publication about creating trails on private lands um, that, that talk about the importance of trying to trace those contours more than cross them because of the runoff and how that impacts the erosion along those trails. Um, but to, to the point about the trees, that's really important. There are in that area that you've depicted, there are a couple of clusters of, of, of large and mature post oaks. And I can just envision on a very hot day, if someone's out there, they're going to want to walk mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. to those clusters. And so, you know, better to facilitate that deliberately than to, you know, we start to have these sort of, uh, I don't know what you call them, but, but pathways that people create on their own. Um, because they're very attractive and they're certainly um, sort of destinations in that landscape. And it might help on your plan to, I think that Phoebe and Maggie were talking about kind of hierarchy of line weights to help describe that. But I'm just curious, some of the distances so that, I, you know, how, how long of a walk is this? Like, is it, is it too long? Is there enough, like, those trees sound like great opportunities for like kind of lingering spots um, and moments to pause. Um, so just kind of getting a better sense of the scale of that walk. And that's where those little switchbacks would help too. Because there's, you know, there's um, seniors and kids and all different types of people that can't can't really have the same experience, take the same journey. Hi, Jane here. I, uh, I just wanted to say that I do think that you could be more considerate of how you're playing your, laying your path out, just sort of um, making it a little more meandering and bringing in that weaving that you're talking about, because that's a very cool metaphor. But I also want to just point out that um, I think you've done a good job of thinking sort of about your client and thinking about their needs and thinking about um, parking, especially, and where you place that and sort of how you laid that out. And I was wondering if you could talk a few more minutes about how you laid out the parking and why you chose that that positioning and the, the sort of um, mirroring that you're doing with the tr terraces. Yeah. So. Um, obviously, like this, this has been like a really unique experience um, to have done like the second part of the studio all online. But I am really grateful that we were able to go to the site twice because um, that was part of the relation with the parking. And I will say, like as I moved through this design, the parking was actually one of the last things that I did. So that was me starting to as you said earlier, Evan, like think about like going with the contours and not crossing them and how that may be contrasted with this like sharp orthogonal prairie shape that was informed by the existing prairie restoration plots. Um, and also just a little bit in terms of grading that I'm currently in a green infrastructure class right now. So the, the idea of the parking lot is that it was along the contours it went from high to low and you could start to maybe at a later point in this project explore what a really green parking lot looked like 
Um, I did have a question. Is is the location that I have it in part of the view shed of the house? Because I know that was feedback. I can go back. There we are. Cool. Um, that would that would be in the view shed where you've got those um, where you have the parking shown. It would need to be to the left of that to be out of the view shed. Um, there's a when you're on the site and if you look at an aerial you can see that the, the pasture that's been maintained um, mm -hmm. almost looks as though it's been deliberately kept as part of that view shed. Um, there's a sort of a, a corral to the um, to the to the west and it's out of sight of of, of your line of sight from the house. So it would need to be a little bit to the um, to the west or looking at your plan to the to the left of where you put it there. Um, as a as a general general overall comment, not just here, but on on the other presentations. Um, one of our major management issues is when you're not on the public roads how do you physically cross these creeks? And apart from one dilapidated bridge that was put up by one of the oil companies in the 1970s, all of the crossings have been, you know, through the, literally through the creek. And, and on, on your plan and on almost all of the plans that I've seen, the, the paths are going across what are physically impassable um, creeks, unless you build something. And not to add another metaphor, but bridging is, I think, an interesting metaphor because the, the creek does divide the Bassett part of the property and the Hopewell part of the property. And this idea of bridging the creek in, in one or more places is an opportunity to sort of develop an idea and just you know, how we decide as, say, as your client, you know, working with, with a prospective landscape architect, how are we gonna make the choices about where to put those specific crossings? What are those gonna look like? I haven't seen that yet in, in any of the presentations, but it is a question that is, is one of the important ones that we're gonna to have to deal with um, pretty soon. Uh, because vast portions of the property are right now physically isolated except on foot. Um, so how we treat those crossings is going to be an issue that we have to confront pretty quickly. Um, I see a lot of creek crossings on that map, and that's a lot of footbridges mm -hmm. I have to build. Okay, we have to move on, um, but thank you, Margaret, and thank, you, thank Margaret. you for all the comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Nice, nice presentation. Thanks. Okay, next we have Yue. Hi. Do I start now? Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen on? Mm -hmm. Cool. So my name is Yue Shen, and this is my Baza Farms, sorry, Baza Farms Revitalization Plan. And my goal for Baza Farm is to revitalize this farm based on uh, this farm-based historical site as a welcoming open space to attract visitors, events, and gatherings, and turn it to be a hub for Kasi and communities nearby. As for the whole site, most of the existing priory and woodland will be preserved, combining the addition of trail for hiking, especially the part on the south or will be planned for restoration with increased species, especially the area along the roadside and close to the grazing and farming area to support the biodiversity of the plant community. Up to the north, there is an area planned for rotational grazing with woods and prairies as the natural boundary. And in the middle, there is a demonstration farm proposed for educational purpose. And there will be a more cultivated meadow planned to hold visitors spending days and nights in retreat cabins or camping in this area on the east. 
and two parcels at the edge of the site are preserved as more exclusive lands for any farming or ecological research. Move to the circulation map. The parking is added along the road in the middle to hold a total of 200 cars with the main parking lot close to the home area and welcoming center uh, hold about 170 and a small parking provides the direct access to Hopewell Cemetery and the research center on the south. And primary path, secondary trail, and bike lines are added all over the site to link the featured spots and connect with the main traffic. Here's the welcoming plaza area, which is close to the historical home area here, with the meeting center and library to welcome the visitors, events, and gathering, and provide the dining space. And there's a ring garden added to absorb the drainage going down from this direction. And there will be three different spaces for the uh, for the out outdoor gathering as well as the events. Farmer's Market is proposed close to the main traffic here, uh, giving chance to possible local product selling and exchanging. And an area for retreat cabins is proposed close to the pound to provide scenery with a direct access from the meeting center coming through as well. The woods surrounded provide this area more privacy. Here's the meadow retreat garden area. Uh, this is a more cultivated meadow, priory, and woodland combined area proposed with retreat cabins to provide an enjoyable and recreational space for people to spend time here. The cabins are proposed along both sides of the road, uh, but I'm showing just one side uh, one side particularly for clear for clearer details as typical example. So around the cabins, there will be edible garden and ornamental garden, uh, providing chance to practice gardening as well as provide uh, the visitors products to eat here. And closer to the road in the middle are the priory and meadows. Uh, the meadows, I define the meadows as more floral species added to the priory base uh, to enhance the enjoyment as well as the diversity of the plant community here. So this is how the dimension of this area will be look like, uh, cutting from this direction on the, on the plan. Uh, here, the path in the middle can provide uh, people space for biking uh, as well. There is a place in the woods and close to the pound provide people a camping area if they're not spending time in the cabins or they seek for more outdoor space. This is a graph, a drawing. I'm showing. I'm trying to show the dynamic community-like retreat garden here that I aim that I'm aiming to achieve in this area. Here, people can plant can bike and spend time in a rural area with comfortable facilities. Here is my demonstration farm. So the goal for this area is to provide demonstration and education to visitors, especially the local farmers and their families on farming and gardening practices and raise their awareness. The location is south to the rotational grazing over here uh, and the whole area is about 19 hectares so uh, with a greenhouse classroom in the middle for educational use and the pollinator garden around the classroom and the grid of the fields are shown in different textures here this is a place to showcase the carbon farming such as living, living fences or broad-based terrace farming, which is suitable for this area because of the erosion and precipitation of this area. And also there's an area for civil pasture demonstration 
uh, combine the use of the rotational grazing on the north here. After all, here's my model of combining prairie, meadow, woodland, farming, and grazing on the same base. The pasture changes over time. The meadow and the cropland has blooming season, the growing season, and dry season, which the plants withered and the land needs to be established. But the priory will be a key feature to connect other types of land use here ecologically and to ensure the plant diversity when other lands are withered and help with the, as, help with the establishment of other lands. So this is how I wish to turn Basel Farm as a hub providing social and ecological connectivity. That's all, thank you. I would like to just begin, uh, this is Jane, by the way. I would like to just begin okay. by saying you have a really beautiful presentation. It's very well put together. And I think that aesthetically it's very pleasing and something that you should be proud to present to a client. Thank you. You anyway, this is Evan and, and I would echo what, what Jane has said. And, and I think some of the ideas that, that stand out to me as being, um, consistent with some of the programmatic goals. Um, and that is the, these, the idea of a you know, demonstration farm, the edible mm -hmm. garden, the ornamental garden. It's, it's amazing how many people, and I would put myself in this category, know very little about the practical aspects of gardening and farming and seeing that sort of the life cycle of a plant and, and um, it, you know, with educational opportunities for, for the kids in this region being very, um, you know, Marlin, the school district there is being run by the state board um, and, and, and is faced shut down numerous times. I mean, the, the opportunities for this kind of enriching educational experience, uh, seeing how things grow and benefiting from that is great. Um, I think that if I understood you had some parking along the road, and I guess if we had lots of people, that might be an issue, but practically speaking, I mean, that's a great distance. Um, um, to, to walk in and, and when we're not, while the roads don't have much traffic at all, um, mm -hmm. one, they're dusty. And number two, when, when people do use them, they're usually pulling cattle trailers and, and, and big trucks and stuff. And so just sort of safety, you know, and just sort of the, they're not big roads, but just the practicality of parking people along the road is um, there are a lot of ditches. And, and frankly, when we see copperheads, they're usually in those ditches. Um, so that's just another sort of thing is we have, a, um, some logistical issues with the, um, with that parking would be a problem. But when you showed that rendering of the, the, the person on the bike, and I, I do like the idea of people using bikes, if you could pull that, when I, when I look at that, that I see a gully that's going to capture all of the rain that comes in a two inch rain and that, that trail is going to be the muddiest mess um, the, the first sort of rainstorm that, that comes through Limestone County. And so what is that? Um, anyway, so that, that's my reaction there. I mean, I like the idea of being able to bike around, mm -hmm. but um, maybe not in those low spots. Yeah, I guess I need to consider about the paving and material in like further design. Well, and I had the same thought, and I think those are opportunities for you to really, you know, plants are really going to want to be in those swales and low places where water collects, and it's a, a great uh, chance to benefit from carving through the land like that. So you, you might want to reconsider if you could move your path up where it's, and then it's looking out onto planting. I actually Always. have like around. So I think uh, for your suggestions, maybe eliminating the road in the middle will be better. Like using a loop instead of the road in the middle, the path in the middle. 
of this area, which will be higher here, like like this area. That's possible, but I think there also might be a way where your bike path is able to, you know, occupy a higher zone within this um, the section. Um, I think one of the things that's exciting about what you're proposing is that the bike um, is a is a way to see a greater distance than you could walking, but um, a diversity of different experiences, right? Um, I think uh, being within that uh, low area causes some issues just for the maintenance of the trail, but also is um, limiting in terms of what you're able to see and experience. So if it were shifted to one side or the other, um, perhaps it would allow you a, a different kind of view, but also um, address some of the concerns about uh, what happens in that gully, right? Okay. Gotcha. I think um, uh, 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 sort of building on that, um, I'm really interested in the variety of different uh, programs that you're um, putting next to each other, the sort of edible garden, ornamental garden, and then um, uh, I guess if we could actually go, yeah, one of these. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's great to be thinking about these different palettes of planting, um, but it's hard for me to get a sense of the appropriate scale for each one of these programs. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, I would look at how they uh, are organized on the site um, as a really intentional series of experiences, right? So I, you know, if you're going to keep working on this, thinking about what scale of edible garden could be sort of maintained um, easily, um, that maybe that uh, gets scaled back, but the ornamental garden comes up close to it. So there's an element that's always beautiful and that you're walking out to, and that perhaps some of the ornamental garden is also uh, showcasing your meadow flowers and has a design relationship to these larger swaths of meadow and prairie that then transition into woodland. And so thinking about the organizational structures um, that are related to the path and the experience of the path, but also um, are probably related to topography and how you're taking advantage of topography, mm -hmm. um, that those things I would study in both the plan um, and thinking about scale, and then also in uh, your section and how those might be adjacent in topographic sectional relationships. Um, because it's such an interesting set of juxtapositions. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but you want to make sure that each experience is visible and is made really clear and is at a scale that makes sense for maintenance as well as um, experience, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. On my list now. <laughs> yeah, I do think your your sections are really effective at communicating your design intent, and I would love to even see it longer. I can I guess we're kind of limited with our the size of our screens, um, mm -hmm. but turning that into a really long transect where you can understand the relationship at a broader scale and how they all are connected to each other. Like the manipulation of topography, while we talked about that path maybe moving, it's a, it's a great um, gesture at, at, at using the land to shape the experience. And like, I'd love to even see the parking on here. Like, is there a, a berm that hides the parking? And is there a you know, a swale that moves beyond that, like really using the section to explain the subtleties in grade manipulation and how it's working to your advantage for each of these different programs. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Anyway, I think it would be helpful um, to understand what is existing and what is being proposed particularly in this area. 
um, because I had the thought that, um, like, I, I can't really tell, and from my memory, um, I can't tell from this plan or from my memory <laughs> whether there is existing tree cover, like, you know, and, and, and it, is this the sort of scrubby um, honey locust um, in pasture area or, you know, what, what is the land cover here? Because, um, okay, so we're just south of the pond. Yeah, right here. Oh, we're up there. We're up there. Okay. So I don't even know if you, did you, did you all visit that portion of the site? Or are you, are you just going from aerial photographs? So I skimmed the aerial satellite photograph as well. I remember that for the area was proposed for private restoration when we went there last time. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about this area as the mostly priory. And for the woods, I just traced the places of, of the woods on the satellite image. So that is why I'm like proposing this metal, private metal garden in right. this area. Okay. I think uh, one of the things that's really interesting about what you've done, but isn't really represented on your on the blow up plan, is mm -hmm. that I think each one of these cabins would have a very unique character, um, either situated um, within the existing woods that maybe you um, enhance with new planting um, or out in um, in the open meadow um, and you know you could really exaggerate that so that you know when I come to stay here I want to stay in the cabin in the woods like totally hidden it's the hermit cabin right um, whereas someone else might might want to like see the 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 meadow moving in the wind and be sort of out there and in a very sort of horizontal kind of landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think like thinking about that and how the character differs. So these aren't, um, uh, it's not a series of cabins that are all the same, um, you know, because there are many of them um, as, you, as you're proposing, um, but that each one is a kind of unique experience. Okay, gotcha. And I think too, and this is seen this maybe earlier too, but when I think of a row of cabins, I think of slave cabins. And so, um, and I don't think that's what we want to be referencing, even if unintentionally so, but the idea of positioning the cabins in different landscapes on different edges, seeing, I mean, that's a great idea. And that does work in the area that you have proposed um, for cabins that, that would work. Um, there is a road that goes back there, it has access to power, um, you know, it, 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 so that it, that would be a successful area to explore further for that use. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you, Yue. Thanks for the comments. Thank you. Okay, next we have Drew. There we go. Let's see. Okay. So, uh, I guess to start off, um, history has a way of changing land over time with each period of a site's existence informing those to come. Bassett Farms was shaped by its ecological and agricultural history, going from forest and prairie to cotton farming and then to cattle grazing. This project addresses the history of Bassett Farms, using the marks of the past as a way to move forward and providing visitors with the opportunity to appreciate the various processes that have and continue to shape Bassett Farms Conservancy. Uh, at Bassett, I, some of the marks I saw on the land I noticed were things like paths cut into the ground, and some were made by wildlife, others left by cattle or vehicles. And another mark, 
There we go. Uh, another mark that was all over were these natural fences or windbreaks that were uh, a man-made fence that had been put in. And over time, as birds drop seeds, trees grew up along them. And in some cases, the original fence was gone, but you could still feel its presence because how nature had responded to the man-made intervention. And this interaction between the natural and built elements responding to each other was a driving idea. And like the trees on the fence line, the design interventions act on opportunities presented by the site. So the design includes five ground cattle grazing pastures set on plots that had once been cleared and have not yet fully reforested. Two open rotational grazing pastures and three silver pastures. There's two plots of restored native prairie a new library and meeting center across the road from the Bassett House, four writer's cabins spread out across the site, and a network of trails, each showing off different aspects of Bassett Farms history, their locations informed by the paths that have already been cut for various reasons. The agricultural trail takes the visitor by the three main, the, the main sections of pastures leading around and between the two pasture types, emphasizing the different forms and bringing attention to the sustainable grazing methods used. Uh, traditional grazing methods let cattle roam the whole pasture, grazing wherever they want. With, it, with these methods, cattle tend to overgraze the ground cover they prefer, leaving undesirable ground cover and can compact the soil in high traffic areas. This negatively affects the health of the ground cover and the biology of the soil leading to unproductive pastures that require supplemental feeding to meet the needs of the cattle. Rotational grazing methods confine the cattle to smaller paddocks within the pastures where cattle will graze all of the ground cover completely before moving on to the next paddock. The pastures are rotated through over the course of a year, giving the grass time to recover, sending out deeper roots and growing back more vigorously than with traditional grazing. With the combination of trees and grass that have large amounts of biomass in the ground, there is a potential to sequester a great deal of carbon, all while providing the cattle all the forage they need. Let's see. So, uh, getting back to the trails, the second trail would take visitors to points of historical significance, including the Hopewell Cemetery, the Hopewell Freedom Colony, and the Hopewell Church, where the Hopewell Church once stood. And pergolas would be set up along this path and would have signage that tell the story of the farm and Hopewell, hoping the visitor to appreciate what they will be seeing from a historical point of view. So yeah, the third path will show off some of the natural beauty of the site and offer an ecological perspective of how the site is returning to a natural form after being so heavily altered for cotton production. Leading from the Bassett House, the visitor will have a view of the restored prairie planted with native grasses and wildflowers. Continuing on, they will see a silver pasture that will be planted with species of trees native to the Kossi area and set adjacent to an area of scrubby uh, honey mesquite and locust, showing the process of primary succession, succession and reforestation. Continuing on from this, the uh, will be contrasted as the visitor moves into the forested portion of the path, showing the next step of succession and an example of the riparian habitat present on the site. All of the trails will interconnect and meet at the library and meeting center, whose forms are inspired by Texas history. The, the meeting center, modeled after ranch style homes that are prevalent in this area of Texas, and the library being inspired by dog truck cabins. The two buildings will be linked by a covered walkway framing one of these naturally occurring fences. And the, the library and meeting center area will act as a condensed representation of what the site has to offer, with the library housing many books on Texas history, a view of the restored prairie, and a short walk to both the Bassett House and the Sulphur Creek just south of it. And also you can see south of the library is one of the four writer's cabins. Uh, and these cabins will be a private area of solace away from it all, but with easy access to the rest of the site. And they are set in picturesque, uh, picturesque areas around the site and are there to give writers a place of peace, fully immersed in the environment to block out the distractions of the outside world 
And it's a, a space where artists can reflect on the nature and history they're surrounded by and contemplate whatever it is that they're working on. Okay, and that's, that's it. Any questions? This is Evan, I'll start. And I, I really appreciated what you said at the beginning about <clears throat> the importance of, of, of dealing with how natural and man-made inter interventions in that environment, um, how they interact and how we manage those. I mean, that is fundamentally our challenge there is how do we balance these historic and cultural resources with natural resources. Um, and, and so that, that idea I think is really important um, to frame what you're doing. I also like the idea of um, thematically um, uh, organized uh, trails to facilitate movement through the site um, that, that might appeal to different people in different ways. Um, so I think that that is that's a, an idea that can be successful. Um, and, uh, and the and also, um, if you go back to the overall site view. Um, the whole plan? Yes. Yes, yeah. yeah so, um, uh, you know, I think that, I think that the, the biggest challenge that we have in terms of moving people in distance is, is how you get from the Bassett Farmstead to Hopewell. I mean, that is a great distance, even as a, a hike you know, you might be more inspired on the way there than you will be on the way back when you've got to walk another mile back to your, your car. Um, but going, playing on this idea of, of bridging the, the, the sort of divide between Hopewell and the Bassett Farm, I, I, I think that the idea of placing that in meeting center, the interpretive center between the Bassett Farmstead and Hopewell is you're going in that direction. And I think that's, um, uh, something that to, to go further with um, where we're not um, necessarily um, we're, we're trying to center the interpretive function between the two places rather than on one specifically um, because I, I don't think we'll ever be able to well the idea of having multiple interpretive centers is not really realistic but having one that sort of bridges that divide and puts positions it between those two historic sites is uh, interesting and I, I also like the way that it sits on the edge of that that pasture and looks out onto that pasture rather than being positioned in the middle of it um that's interesting so i, I appreciate your ideas here true um when you were uh on this drawing when you were setting up uh, where the conditions of silva pasture, open pasture, and restored pasture landed and their forms. What was determining those forms? Are those from the existing traces or? Yes, these oops. are from the existing traces and the, the collection of four main ones. Uh, the two open pastures are currently open. I believe they're, they're seeded out as prairie restoration at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the two silva pastures are halfway in between being reforested and some of that scrubby mesquite honey locust. So it was going with that idea of it's already got some of that form just capitalizing on what, what's there already. Okay, um, and then for the restored prairie, is that the same sort of uh, existing condition but perhaps emphasized or? Yes, yeah, it's, it's open and I think, I believe from the plans from you guys that that is the area where a &M is already proposing to help with the seeding of native prairie. Okay. It's, it's relatively open now. It's starting to get, um, starting to grow up in that, in the mesquite. And uh, where you have the silver pasture on the sort of Northwest quadrant is an area that we were thinking about some controlled burns mm -hmm. um, to, to, to manage that, that landscape. So those uses in those places are, are 
to make sense with what's physically there and, and what we've talked about as potential future. That's helpful. Um, I, I also uh, love how you started with your discussion of um, observations on site of uh, the different kinds of traces and paths and the um, different kind of edge conditions. I have, I grew up um, in an area that used to be an orchard and there are always those like beautiful windbreak and remnant fences that um, became sort of informal walking trails. So uh, I share that interest. Um, I think what would help uh, me is um, if you did a sort of a site analysis of some form that showed where those existing, so you showed the traces and wind breaks as best you can, even if it's just for a small portion, and then showed us a little bit of how um, your design is emphasizing those or building off of those um, as, a, as a set of strategies informing where things are. Um, it's hard to tell what is an existing found condition that you're keeping versus what's your design intervention. And starting with such a poetic um, set of traces really makes me want to understand when we are just taking advantage of an existing condition and when your design is showing us a condition that you want us to understand as culturally significant, right? Sometimes we do want to use it and sometimes it's the view that we are meant to observe, right? Um, so just uh, mapping that and then also perhaps doing a little axon diagram or section diagram that shows how your intervention um, capitalizes on these found traces would just be really helpful. Um, and then I think it, it could perhaps have a set of um, pathways and perhaps expansions of some of these conditions that um, start to feel like they're filling in some of the edges or are creating pockets of transition that allow us to understand the form of one versus um, the transition to the next and moments of overlap versus moments of really uh, designed distance and space and barrier. Uh, which I think is some of what you were showing in your section where we're walking through and seeing the cattle and we're in a fence and then the cattle are also in a fence. Um, so that they're, it's really viewing these things and moving between rather than within. And, and Drew, one other one other point, and, and this might extend to some of the other proposals for holistic grazing, and that is that the cattle are going to be thirsty, and so access to water and in the different pastures, that's important. It looks like on the northwest side, you've you've got incorporated some of the existing livestock tanks um, on that eastern portion. I don't see access to water, um, and so you know, just thinking about the sustainability of the site. To the extent, because we do get about, I think, 35 inches of rain a year, those those ponds are rarely completely dry. So there is always going to be, I think, a way to harness nature to provide the water for the cattle um, without having to pipe it in, maybe as a supplement. If it's a drought situation, we need to think about that. But um, for this proposal and for some of the others that showed some holistic grazing pastures, that access to water is going to be critical. Yes, on, on these, um, I wasn't. It, I was worried that it may not be enough, but I did try to incorporate the those cattle tanks, the ponds that are in there. And on one of these, I proposed adding one, and I think it would be helpful to show that it's proposed and not just an existing thing. And mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of blends in with the pattern a little bit. I think that's why you can't see them. Sure. But uh, yeah, so. Is definitely um, needs to be thought out more, but it was thought was at least touched on. Great. Um, yeah, Drew. I also really appreciate how you walked us through. Um, it just felt like a really um, natural transition to explain your way of thinking and how it led your direction here. 
And I love the seasonality diagram. And I'm just wondering if you could sort of play up all of these elements and dig in. Um, so that diagram that you did, could you apply that and overlay it on top of the site plan? You know, what, where are, I think there are gonna be certain places that are more impactful during certain seasons. Like when you talk about your fence line and you know, the, the, the birds that would sit on the fence, you know, fence, like, is that happening? Where is that? And is that in the spring? And where are these moments that um, are presenting themselves at different seasons? And especially with all the wildlife and the flora and fauna, I think that, that you could just emphasize it more and let your, let it help guide your plan. Definitely. Yeah. Jane here. Um, I, I really appreciate that you sort of took into consideration that we are preservation Texas. And so we are um, preservation minded and looking back at and you considering and looking at these different historical forms of, of architecture and then also looking at the historical ways that the land was used. Uh, I appreciate you looking at it through that scope. And Drew, I think I think yours, um, like like a lot of the others too, could benefit from just more um, more overlap and exploring opportunities for that. So um, I, I really love how it's organized, and you have kind of a branded experience, so to speak. But um, what happens when those cross over and kind of have a, a node of intersection. And um, that's not only interesting for the visitor, but also for um, wildlife and um, the, just beefing up those edge conditions. Yeah, definitely. I did put, I was working on some of the connections between the paths, but it's definitely something that I wanted to work on more to see how the two blend into each other, that they're not all separate, uh, discrete mm -hmm. experiences, but they all do play into each other. And, and this is a really nice plan, too. I think there's some thickness to it that helps articulate what you're doing, and texture. Yeah, I just want to commend you on the level of um, iteration that you um, that you committed to um, throughout this this last portion of the semester. Your project has developed extensively, um, and even like the last changes that you made to the parking, I think are are really beneficial. Um, and that you know you didn't stop after the first or second or third time, but you just kept working um, these things and it, it really shows. Um, and also just the development in your graphics um, has been wonderful to see. Okay, um, if anyone doesn't have any additional comments, we'll, we'll move on. Thanks, Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe I'm up. Okay. Sorry, I was muted, but yes, you're up, Kate. <laughs> are you are you in a fake okay. studio? Are you in, I a am simulated in a fake studio? <laughs> a simulated studio? <laughs> it is a fake studio. I took this picture the day that we uh, got to go back to clear out our desks, so I would have it for Zoom. <laughs> okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Sorry, I had an issue there with the screen share. And first of all, um, thanks for being here again, y'all. Great. Um, so my master plan for uh, Bassett Farms, my agenda sought to use 
the sites for us, both as the primary site of change, as well as the agent of change, uh, to see how we could use the forests and the forest ecosystems and the processes and services that they offer um, in order to meet a number of site goals, which include uh, supporting cattle grazing, which happens through the silvopasture, the provision of crops through the orchards, um, the foundation of thriving biodiverse ecosystems through the riparian buffer zone, and the interpretation of site history uh, happening through the Hopewell sacred growth. So as for my ecological intervention, uh, three main treatments are going to be applied to the land. The first of those um, is the thinning treatment to the silvopasture system. So the silvopasture will integrate cattle husbandry with forestry on the site, and we can create a hybridic ecosystem that fosters both of those activities uh, by thinning existing stands of trees. Uh, this way, 50 head of steer can be moved between about acre and a half paddocks every two days as part of a rotational grazing regime. Um, the second intervention is in the orchards where we'll be planting uh, native and adapted species that provide economic activity through crops and, and also visitor interest. Um, and then the third is through the riparian buffers, uh, which can serve to restore the creek's present uh, condition as well as protect the creek ecosystems as the site develops um, and agricultural activity intensifies. Uh, so as for why we're choosing a carbon farming system, it's useful at Bassett, both because it can address local issues uh, that the site is facing and because it can provide the service of demonstrating regenerative methods. Uh, Texas is a leader in cattle husbandry. There are almost 100 million cows in Texas today. That's more than any other U.S. state. Um, that population is only expected to rise as population rises and as beef consumption rises. So this is a critical time to address issues um, in beef production. And of course, beef has a bad reputation in terms of its carbon footprint at about six and a half pounds of carbon emissions per serving. So Bassett Farms is really uniquely positioned um, and has a huge opportunity to reach beef producers uh, because of how extensive beef production is in Texas and the central location. So silvopasture and rotational grazing offer an advantage over conventional methods, uh, both in reducing and mitigating greenhouse gases. So managed grazing maximizes the opportunity for carbon sequestration in the soils. If you look at the left of the chart in conventional methods, overgrazing is rampant, which uh, reduces root mass and stunts regrowth, uh, which leads to degree. Uh, I'm so sorry, I have too much caffeine. I drink a lot of kombucha. Uh, stunted regrowth wastes the carbon sequestration opportunity and it also degrades topsoils. Um, I also wanted to point out with this chart how important it is um, to manage undergrazing as well uh, because uh, grasses that are allowed to grow too tall actually become less nutritious for grazers. Um, and finally, a benefit of this system that I want to mention is animal welfare. Silvopasture offers shade comfort to animals that's absent in a traditional system. And it also offers a more complete nutritional palette. Um, ruminants that are raised on feedlots or conventionally grazed offer, often suffer chronic malnutrition, um, which is extremely uncomfortable for them. Uh, and a more complete nutritional palette also reduces their methane emissions because they're healthier animals. So it actually, yeah, that was, that was a euphemism. Um, so it actually reduces their greenhouse gas impact overall. So how can Bassett Farms be converted to a silvopasture system? So this will require a mechanical thinning effort, uh, first to remove the unfavorable trees, such as invasives that are found on the site um, or diseased or degraded stands. Um, and then continued thinning will help us achieve uh, a mixed canopy cover that allows the room for forage growth and for grazing. The long-term management of the system would be the periodic removal of understory vegetation that reduces competition for light. Uh, a rule of thumb I invented in order to maintain the proper density of trees is to uh, maintain a 35 foot buffer around the choice vegetation. This system also sequesters carbon both in the body of the trees and in the roots of removed trees. They're allowed to decay in place enriching soil carbons locally. Um, so as for my orchard, this will be placed across from the Bassett homestead um, at the sort of central entrance to the site. This offers economic programming and visitor interest, uh, but I also wanted to reframe the history of agriculture on the site. I used an orderly uh, 
planting scheme, but that orderly scheme loosens at the margins of the orchard, sort of suggesting a breakdown between the binary of cultivated and wild land on the site. Um, pecans are the primary species in the orchard. They're interwoven with rows of fruit trees. The wide spacing here reduces the risk of pests and diseases, and it also allows for alley intercropping um, to provide more diverse function here. And the seven species that are chosen for the orchard offer interest throughout the growing season, and it also offers um, a very unique experience any month of the year that visitors come. And so finally, the riparian buffers. Um, at a width of 160 feet on both sides of the creek, the buffer is able to most efficiently mitigate polluted runoff with the primary concern on this site uh, being cow manure, uh, the pathogens and the nutrients in cow manure. In the zone closest to the creek, plants can stabilize degraded slopes and then further up the bank, plantings can also diversify the understory creating habitat benefits for migratory birds and for pollinators. And then finally, my cultural intervention uh, centered around the Hopewell Sacred Grove is minimal as possible. So the cemetery is currently very heavily wooded and it's uh, challenging to navigate. So I imagine a procession of clearings that lead one uh, between the clusters of the grave sites. The idea of the, the sacred grove is part of the religious traditions both of West Africa, um, the site of extraction for many people who were, would be enslaved and taken to the Americas, um, as well as the tradition of Christian Protestantism, which was the religion practiced by the people of the Hopewell community. So my intention is to create moments of reverence and reflection uh, that fueled the interpretation of the Hopewell story at the cemetery. All right, thanks so much, y'all. Well, Catherine, I appreciate your graphics. The, um, that view that you had of, of, of thinning, filling and, and restoring and then thinning, shipping, shaping and um, managing, uh, those were, were very helpful um, and, and very clear, um, very, um, I think well executed and as well as the circular chart uh, where you're showing what was growing in the different seasons. Um, I thought that was very effective. And so I, th I think some of your graphics, your presentation has been, been great. Um, uh, I wanted the last thing you just uh, were touching on the idea of hope well as a sacred grove. Um, you know, as we've done some work on, on researching hope well, talking to descendants and also um, some of the, the sort of experts in the field, um, the idea of Hopewell as a contemplative place mm -hmm. is, is been one that's very important. And, and so your approach to it as a sort of a sacred place uh, touches on something that I think um, uh, will ultimately be um, uh, part of the, the long-term plan there. Um, and I think too, um, you know, when in some of the feedback we've been getting, whether it's from USDA or Dixon Water Foundation, the the, the cattle that that is raised through the holistic grazing that's allowed to to um, to eat these native grasses, um, you know, it's it, they can be sold at a premium mm -hmm. um, over these sort of feedlot cattle. Um, it's a sustainable approach, and and I think that that the more opportunity that we have to demonstrate that practice to area ranchers, um, that's a need that the USDA has identified is they just, they don't have anywhere to show people how to do that. Yeah. And so I appreciate what you've done in laying that out for us in a pretty comprehensive way. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, uh, this is Jane. I appreciate that you incorporated your research and the, your thoughts into your presentation. I think it was a really good presentation. And I just wanted to commend you on that uh, and including your thoughts on, on not just presenting what you're showing, but actually including statistics. And when you're speaking with a client, those things are so important to give. So um, good job. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Yeah, I, I have learned a lot from all of y'all. Um, just a really interesting project ripe with so many um, complex 
issues at hand. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be throwing out these stats about 100 million cattle. And <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that research and analysis, like all of you have shown, and in particular here, it is, is very helpful in creating a rich design that it's coming from somewhere um, where you have, uh, you know, you've developed a passion and a knowledge and kind of a niche of understanding that you want to address in the site. So mm -hmm. I definitely appreciate that. I think, I do think it's ha really hard to start a presentation with a site plan. Um, you guys know this site really well, so it might work for each other, but um, as reviewers who haven't been to the site and I'll just speak for myself on that. It's hard to see a site plan and that's the introduction to the project. So I would encourage you to lead up to it more with your, um, your kind of thesis and initial observations and kind of slowly lead us along that path too, because we kind of need to be fed the morsels that are your uh is is your unique perspective that you're trying to present okay um yeah and and also i think to your point about all the cattle you do have a lot of cows in your scale this is a small point but i think we want to see more people in your okay. drawings to show um that human experience because a grove is a wonderful place to be as a Person, as well as the plants and um, wildlife that appreciate it too. Um, and I think, I, I love how you have these like dimensions that you figured out and that makes sense from your kind of scientific analysis, but what does 35 feet feel like as a person? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how does that make sense kind of navigating that, that space? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I want to build on uh, Laura's two thoughts here. And I think the note of um, uh, for everyone of just uh, building up um, through your argument to the site plan so that even if it is people who really know the site well, you're helping them to see the site through your particular conceptual lens and your observations as a designer um, and thinking about the future of the site and its space. Um, it's your opportunity to reframe it through your lens and uh, lead people along in the design decisions that you ultimately present. Um, and that can be as simple as a plan that builds up through a series of slides or offers a little bit of analysis. Um, Catherine, your, your project is so uh, um, thoughtful in the way that you've developed a set of metrics that are informing the decisions that you make. Um, and it's, it's really, it's great to see that level of thinking um, and also the framing that you introduced so strongly of the forest as, um, as the site of change as well as the agent of change, I think is such a great way of framing this. And it's clear how that is pulled throughout through these three different strategies. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, I think that that's where the site, the, the um, slide that's just after this start makes me raise a couple of questions. Um, and yeah, so when we get to the orchard, um, I, get curious how this um, how this grid is informed by the idea of orchard or maybe I'm misreading this. Is this the same 35 foot dimension or how did this um, scale so, get determined? Yes, yeah, so the 35 foot dimension um, is found in the grazing lands. Mm -hmm. uh, the spacing on these trees, um, the biggest circles are the pecans, which have a hundred feet between them, and then the um, the fruit trees are planted like alternating in the windows, like a quincunx, which gives mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, the hypotenuse of that like fifty by fifty triangle. I don't know the distance off the top of my head, That's so fine. it's it's pretty widely spaced to allow um, 
for more open area between the trees that there can be intercropping. That's okay. how I arrived at that spacing. Yeah, I just, um, I wonder when I look at it in plan, it looks like very loose and open. And I think to the point of what it feels like as a human being, um, like there's the experience of it. And that's where perhaps uh, when you were talking about the edges getting looser, maybe the grid breaks up even more um, in terms of, to offer a really thoughtful, immersive human experience. Um, but then I think the same level of, of um, argument, if you were gonna spend more time on this in terms of what's ideal for intercropping to underpin this, um, the spacing would be really helpful. Um, but it's, yeah, it's great that you had a reason behind this. Um, it just made me wonder. Uh, and then I think like your sections are just so beautiful that I want the same sort of level of texture and mm -hmm. um, and layering to be present in the way that you're presenting this in plan, um, mm -hmm. which often feels a little bit more diagrammatic, but that might just be something to strive for in the next round of edits. Okay. Have, have you all, uh, I don't know if you've taken a little field trip out to native Texas nursery out east but um, it's a great nursery and actually adjacent is a pecan orchard and it is stunning. I mean, it is really beautiful. And um, so it's something you could go to to actually experience firsthand. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause this is so interesting. You guys are gonna keep, keep working on it, I'm sure. Um, but the, they have a totally different spacing um, and it would just be interesting, I think, for you to walk between the rows and mm -hmm. kind of understand the, the differences in density. And um, I think that the module you're building, you have, um, yeah, a, a very articulate reasoning, but it you could build in some flexibility to that mm -hmm. and um, kind of understand because yeah, walking between two gorgeous 40-foot canopy pecans is like just a great Texas experience. And, <laughs> um, and that's again where once you start putting your human scale figures in here, you can sort of start to see opportunities for moments like that. And, yeah, I mean, I think like my thought is if these pecans are planted as small trees, um, even you know, 50 feet between trees is is forever. Yeah. You know, when you have small trees, it's it's just vast. Like I think the one thing that's really positive is you have so many trees that you would still read it. But I think in terms of like people being able to walk out there and gain some shade, we're talking about like 30 years into the yeah. future. Um, so, you know, that, that leads me to the, the possibility of, well, well, what if there's a different strategy, right? Or what if there's a more, um, a denser planting that then gets thinned over time since we're talking about thinning? Um, or, uh, yeah, like there's sort of like, do you, do you rely on some existing um, vegetation until they get large? Um, is the exist are the existing trees thin slowly over time? Um, so I think that's an interesting premise. I think overall, like the premise of thinning um, and shaping as a design strategy um, is um, is just really wonderful. Um, you know, really sensitive to the site. Um, but where I see opportunity in your um, proposal is to just um, maybe to have a, a, a sort of heavier hand as a designer, um, bringing to the table the, the, like your own shaping of form um, as it relates to human experience. Because um, I, while I, I appreciate that you've developed these metrics and they're, they're substantiated, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, a, in an important way, um, I, I think like there should be more than just the prescription, right, of how mm -hmm. to do this. Um, and um, like the perfect example is Hopewell, 
um, right? But I think even in the agricultural fields, um, to think about how you could thin and shape in a way that is beautiful. You know? mm -hmm. So then what are the criteria of beauty? I mean, mm -hmm. it's certainly not a, a like 35 foot spacing therefore gives you beauty. <laughs> So, so you have to go a level deeper, right? Like, well, it probably depends on what species of trees we're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. what the diversity is, what the particular form um, and experience of those species are, you know, sort of thinning post oaks um, is different than thinning um, ash juniper. Or yeah. if you have an ash juniper, a post oak, um, uh, you know, and, I don't know, a mesquite and a honey locust, like what, what do you have? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that there could be an overlay of other kinds of prescriptions or mm -hmm. um, sort of specificity that you're bringing to the table and in um, creating, like maybe you focus on certain areas mm -hmm. um, where, where you really wanna, um, you want to create a human experience, right? Okay. A human experience is largely around um, aesthetics, um, scale, uh, uh, physical comfort, right? So shade, um, experience of light, um, all of those things. Um, <clears throat> and at the in the Hopewell portion, um, I also really appreciated that you're drawing on this precedent of the sacred grove. Um, it just feels really appropriate. Um, and, and that you're so minimal, right? That you could, you could so minimally do it by subtracting mm -hmm. um, rather than um, planting or intervening in, in some other way. It's such a sensitive landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if, if, it, if I were the designer, I would be sort of now moving towards um, okay, well, what are the what are the sacred grove precedents? Mm -hmm. What is the specific precedent that that I'm going to draw on? Mm -hmm. um, what does it look like? What's its form? Um, and then how do I translate that to be my own? So, um, you know, I I I think like testing um, different kinds of thinning and subtraction to create different kinds of uh, forms across this sacred grove, uh, because it seems like the possibilities are many, um, not just a clearing, a circular clearing, but there could be a lot of ways that you could sort of enhance the experience of a sacred grove. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, to, again, like really focused on hum human experience, right? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people coming to visit this place and to kind of enhance their um, their knowledge of the place, but also their um, their connection, their ability to connect with with what is there, um, with the importance of the history. So you want to create a kind of sense of reverence. Mm -hmm. okay. And that that crossover where we're talking about like groves and the Hopewell Cemetery, um, these kind of one point perspectives that you get it reminds me too of Arlington Cemetery. Um, mm -hmm. I know you're not designing a cemetery necessarily here, but it's such a tight grid um, and it is so precise. And it's really interesting the different views you get. Um, you know, looking one direction, uh, you see kind of straight through. And then if you shift your view, if you turn around, you know, you get this completely different long shot view, mm -hmm. um, kind of depending on where you're positioned within the grid. Um, and I think it's just a great opportunity here to think about those moments where uh, it's, it's just a really different experience depending on which way you're looking, if you're looking cross through and what's your, what's your terminus and Mm -hmm. Is there a destination? Because there is some built-in monotony to a grid. So, so why go down? Why go down this uh, avenue as opposed to that avenue? What okay. makes them special and interesting? Yeah. 
It's really hard at Hopewell. Like what you're proposing, I think it's, I think it's not easily done. Mm -hmm. um, the cemetery is um, happens. You know, it, it's uh, it's not regular in its form. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to find what's there. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the ground is is um, irregular. It's not flat. It's not sculpted. Um, you know, it's not like uh, these other cemeteries um, have they're, they're additive designs, right? Like they mm -hmm. are the the logic of their form has been predetermined um, and very tightly determined. Um, but where you have so much idiosyncrasy um, and happenstance, um, where the you know the cemetery has grown over time and and evolved over time. Um, at, at least a lot of the um, the plants, mm -hmm. you know, um, of their own accord, um, after maybe they were they were put there by humans. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think it's it's tough to like create a, a legible form that is powerful. It's not yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, the, the current state of the cemetery is very disorderly. And when we visited, I felt like I didn't know where to go. And so um, the sort of subtractive method came sort of by imagining a very simple way to just tell people where to walk because it also was uncomfortable. I was like, am I about to step on someone's grave because I couldn't find anything? So it sort of seemed to me if you can create an outdoor room you, there can be a focal point of the room and then you know where you're supposed to be and where you're not supposed to be and you're not so worried you're going to disrespect someone so you can focus on the the qualities and the meaning of the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I it seems like there might, um, there might also be the possibility to create a secondary layer on the ground plane, mm -hmm. um, maybe through mowing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like something to um, create more definition uh, because the trees by themselves, um, uh, some of them fairly mature, some of them smaller, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that at that sort of spacing and mixture of species, I think might not, um, they might not create the kind of enclosure that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like there there could be a secondary layer where your feet are um, okay. that kind of help you. I, again, like I think of mowing because it's another subtractive mm -hmm. um, process rather than like bringing in path material or some or make, creating lines or like it doesn't seem like you want to do that. It wants to be something that's flexible, changing and um, and again, kind of subtracting. Mm -hmm. We found where we have mowed to create pathways, uh, we've, it's, nature has responded in a very positive way. I mean, it's, it's this like nice vegetation has grown in where it has been kind of like thick and weedy. Um, you know, it's just it's responding very well where we're creating pathways with just mowing. Um, mm -hmm. So we definitely second that idea. And it's also been recommended to us and, and it's somewhat intuitive, like, like you say, when you're walking specifically through the cemetery, because of the nature of it, and, and, and many, if not most of the people buried there don't have headstones, mm -hmm. you never really know where you're walking and what you're going to be walking on. And so to the extent that circulation can be managed by creating pathways, um, that's going to ensure the long-term preservation of the site, um, mm -hmm. but also make people more comfortable in, in, in being there. Has it ever been considered to um, keep people out? Like you, you, you know, you you walk the perimeter, mm -hmm. but you you can't actually enter. Well, I think that, I mean, for the the descendants who want to go, will still want to. I mean, a lot of the descendants of the people buried there um they've since moved away and not been back for generations and so to the extent that you know we can start to reconnect descendants of the hopewell families with the site they're going to want to visit they're going to want to see some of those 
places sure. where their relatives are buried. But that's not to say that um, the, that you can't do some some pathway, create some pathways around it. Um, right now, the fence that's there is designed to keep cattle out. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, I, I think there is still going to need to be access to it to, to um, for the descendants at a minimum, mm -hmm. um, even if it's somewhat sporadic. Um, and, and we don't know too that there may be per people buried outside the boundaries of that fence mm -hmm. that does exist. So um, at some point we are going to be doing some ground penetrating radar to see specifically where all of the burials are. Um, that's made more challenging because of the, the overgrown condition, but uh, it's in the long-term plan, medium-term plan. Yeah, I, I just, I think it's really a, a kind of exciting um, design challenge to th think about sacred ground as, mm -hmm. you know, is it, a, is it something you tread on um, or is it, you know, does it, do, do you sort of remove people from the surface of the, of the ground um, and have a, you know, a sort of cantilevered or um, elevated um, uh, approach. Um, and, you know, it makes me think of some of the tactics that have been used with archaeological sites, particularly in Europe, you know, where, where um, ur urban populations have to contend with archaeological sites, you know, in conflict with like places in the city that have to be used. Um, and uh, they're, they're very good at kind of um, integrating contemporary use with a kind of reverence for history or very sensitive ground. Um, and I think it's something that we do less well. We're just sort of like, we try to, we try, we try to you know, we try to make it work, but we don't, um, we, we don't, we don't take a hard line of like separating, right? Of kind of like really distinguishing um, or, or separating a kind of contemporary path or contemporary use with, um, with our preservation. Um, so this site just seems like there's a lot of potential there. And um, I think the idea of, of sort of minimal touch um, is pretty powerful. All right. Um, thank you, Kate. Uh, thank you. So, um, Bridget, are you still I'm back? Yeah. Are you back? All right. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully my, uh, my internet and all my power doesn't go out again. So okay. Bridget just lost power. So it's very um, hot in LA. So everything's short circuiting. Um, anyway, sorry about that. Um, great. Thank you all for being here. I'm Bridget Newsham. Uh, let me pull. Can you see it? Is it white for you all? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why it's not showing up. Okay, um, I'll just do that instead. Hmm. Um, maybe it's loading. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I guess I'll do that until it loads fully. Okay. Um, when we first visited Bassett Farms, I was really taken with the interesting social and e ecological history of the farm. It encompassed a uni unique combination of ecological devastation through cotton farming and overgrazing, racial violence, economic prosperity, and failure. Many heavy things occurred on this farm, and yet it also exuded a sense of opportunity as well. Oh man, why is it not there? I'm so sorry, I don't, it was working just a second ago. Let me try to close this. Um, nope. I can also um, pull it up, Bridget, and okay. um, share my screen. Okay. Um, um, great. Uh, and I can just say, like, slide when. Yeah. Okay, perfect.
sorry, it's, I, I, I have also had technical issues with my computer lately. So it's like the <laughs> blind leading the blind here, but <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. uh, oops. Um, if you wouldn't mind just starting on the site plan. Whoa. Okay. Uh, let me share the window to the front. Sorry. Okay, is everyone seeing that? Yeah. Okay, uh, the agenda for this site was to create a space that acknowledged the complicated history of the farm, allowing one to bear witness to what had occurred there, while also providing room for, to reflect and experience what is possible for the future. When designing a site, there were three ways in which this was accomplished. Um, next. First, the concept of the labyrinth rose. The labyrinth is a symbol that relates to wholeness. It consists of a form that creates a meandering yet purposeful path. The re-envisioned lab labyrinth will connect the many parts of the site together, the old, the new, the painful, and the hopeful. It will ebb and flow through the space, switching back at times to the same location to explore the already seen. Next. The labyrinth will begin at the home place where the Bassets resided, with a heavily vegetated parking lot across the street. Next. Here there will be a library filled with historical literature and documents about the farm and all those who resided there. Visitors are able to read and learn about the farm before embarking on their journey. Next. Or merely hop, hop on the trail from the parking lot itself. Um, next. The design is intended to guide visitors through the site, walking them through densely vegetated areas at times, providing space for quiet, solitary contemplation. Next. And at others swerving so close to other paths, a visitor can almost reach out and touch the person parallel to them. Uh, next. The paths ebb and flow in size and material to slow the walker as they meander through the site. Next. Those on the trail will experience the area around the Hopewell community, which, which was once owned, <clears throat> found, excuse me, found, founded, owned, and managed by uh, freed slaves several times. The intention is to experience the importance of the community in shaping the land and, and farm. Next. The second objective was to use vegetation as a method of differentiating between varying historical and restorative areas of the site. In the home place quadrant of the site, the ex existing scrubland, which includes mesquite and honey locust, will be maintained and slightly thinned. The forest, mainly consisting of cedar elm and white oaks surrounding the Hopewell community, will be expanded to create a dense contemplative space. Next. 750 acres will be planted in the grove formation and act as a designated area for silvopasture, a method of intensive grazing that helps revive the soil and sequester carbon into the ground. The trees in the grove will be planted 35 feet apart from one another for optimum carbon sequestration. There will also be 600 acres dedicated to prairie restoration, a practice already begun on the site. Um, next. The third objective will be to highlight the thresholds on the site between the managed and the wild, the once was and the what will be. Next. Visitors will spend a considerable amount of time walking along an imagined threshold, a threshold between the silvopasture and the redeveloped grasslands to bring the site closer to what it had been prior to cotton farming. Next. The site also includes four artist cabins to provide space for an artist residency program on the site and a gathering space accessible to the artists and all visitors walking along the labyrinth. Next. 
In contrast to the seemingly untamed farm, the building will be a sleek all glass structure jutting into the grassland. The gathering space will both be programmed and also be left for more informal conversations about visitors experiences or act as a place for rest. Each element of the design works towards centering the narrative of Bassett's farms, Bassett farms into one cohesive space. Thank you. Maybe would you mind going through those first few slides one more time? Sure. Do you want me to keep going? Um, I just thought that was a really nice introduction to your project. And um, I, I thought you also used a lot of powerful language to uh, describe the story and, and your intention. And uh, I think this labyrinth is really compelling. Um, it, it kind of implies in, intentionally getting lost. And you referenced a lot of going backwards to kind of figure out how to get forwards, forward. And um, I think that that's really rich and is created some interesting path networks on your plan that I think could even be explored further. Um, and I know that the labyrinth is, is so interesting that so many different cultures have embraced that form. Um, and of course you can go down, uh, you know, not to get too much into your metaphor, but you can go, go down a rabbit hole. You can, <laughs> you can go in circles on that one, but um, I just think that's a really interesting metaphor to use to guide your process. And um, it, it's certainly compelling. I think I had some more questions just about the specific experiences. And maybe, maybe you can go forward to those like sectional moments because sure. I know there's a lot of topography on the site, but I wasn't seeing a lot of that, manipula that, that manipulation in the context of your labyrinth metaphor? Um, yeah, I didn't manipulate the topography really much at all. Um, the only substantial change I made to the actual um, topography was, um, Phoebe, if you wouldn't mind just going to the section cut of the silver pasture and the grassland. Um, I really just sort of like cut out the earth and at one point um, to sort of slide this path into the earth to act as that physical barrier. Um, but outside of that, I, I pretty much kept the topography about the same since it was fairly flat and um, frankly, like fairly easy to work with, which is unique and nice. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Go, go ahead, Maggie. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I was, I also loved your, your verbal presentation was really compelling. And um, I think the axons and the sections are starting to get at these ideas of um, threshold and transition. And I'd love to see that uh, brought to be even more apparent because I, I think one of the things that your labyrinth path does is to really exploit edge and transition between zones. And um, it's such a beautiful thing to be thinking about as you're designing a path experience. Um, one, I wonder if it maybe um, has a smaller sort of uh, meandering path that happens at a tighter grain 
perhaps mm -hmm. near some of the buildings so that um, you wouldn't have to go on a huge journey, but you could kind of see a snapshot in some ways. Um, and I think uh, working through um, your axons and sections to make even more of them um, explorations of transitions between zones, like here talking about the idea of moving from managed to wild and um, just highlighting that through the different kinds of um, environments and uh, field conditions that you're creating so that we understand um, even more in, in a designed way what that threshold feels like to go from wild uh, sort of heavily enclosed to something more managed and perhaps a bit more open. Um, I would just amp these up a little bit more so that it's really clear um, what those transitions feel like and how you've thought about the design of that transition to be educational and experiential. Okay. Yeah, I, I will second that. I think um, amplifying what you have um, is the way to go. Um, and I, I love these axonometric drawings. Um, they're so spatial and they're, they just show you this fast scale that is so powerful. People are so small. I mean, it's like, it, it kind of like, it really is really fitting with the idea of the labyrinth, right? Where you're sort of doing some kind of meditation on your, your sort of state of being in the world. <clears throat> um, but, you know, when I think about moving through the existing landscape as I experienced it when we were there and then hitting some point where it just opens up, right? I mean, that's what the, this sort of grazing land would be, like the space between these trees. You're, you're showing like a monocrop, um, monoculture, monocultural planting of trees. So it's there's a uniformity, there's, a, there's spaciousness. Um, the vegetation on the ground plane would be really different because there would be a sort of like continuity on the ground plane likely, whereas in the existing landscape, it's so variable with all of the woody, um, small woody shrubs. You know, it's not like, uh, I think um, herbaceous vegetation can can be understood as, as one thing, like a meadow can be understood as one thing, even though it's composed of lots of different species. But when you start to get shrubs um, and, and woody material, it all of a sudden starts to feel like um, it's not one thing. Um, and so there's a, there's a sort of unpredictable diversity in the existing landscape that wouldn't be in this, in this new, um, grazing land and at that point like what is that is that do you, do you want people to come up to that edge and and like whoa you know or or is there some sort of pacing of the change um is there a is, is it a wide threshold or is it a moment um so i think you could really explore that um and that could do a lot to increase legibility for people um you know, to, to make it really clear that this is designed um, and that they, they, they can read the landscape and understand um, or respond to, to what you're creating. Um, there's one place, and then I'll just be quiet so others can speak, but there's one, um, there's one way in which um, I, I think you break your rules. <laughs> um, and it, I, it sort of undermines things for me. So I think like you have these nested loops, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but like this place here, right? It And this place here, it's like you break mm -hmm. your rules. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think I, I would rather you not provide a shortcut for somebody. Mm. Okay. It's like really impractical, right? But you have these, it's sort of like, this is the rules of the game. Like you, mm -hmm. mu you when you travel on these, you're not cutting across, <laughs> you know, it's like you're, you're definitively creating this kind of experience of the site. 
Um, and I would, I would just like be all in on mm -hmm. creating that. And if, if, if there, if someone needs to cut across, they can, they can walk across the field or they can, you know, but like, you're not designing that, you're not designing in a shortcut. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Like think yeah, about it, is. think about it like a true labyrinth, right? It doesn't have, it's not like, oh, but yeah. someone might get tired. <laughs> so we better think of them. <laughs> Yeah, the the larger path is is like thirteen miles, and so that's why I was like, maybe I should like somewhere in the center give them a little like respite if they want to leave. Um, but I understand what you're saying. But yeah. maybe and maybe like where they're really close, right? It's like it's feasible that you could just you could just move over and return yeah. if you needed to, um, or there are like there's you know a, a kind of different material there practically you know you, you could put stepping some kind of stepping stones or um or you know segmented material that would allow people to move across but it's not part of your primary system okay that makes sense <clears throat> and and you're sort of intended to retrace your steps as part of this too right that's the yes exactly okay I am curious, do, do you have, do these paths have different widths or different materials or, you know, this drawing makes them look uniform, but I didn't know if you thought any further about that. Um, I have thought about that. Um, and I, I was, I, I hadn't felt like I had really fleshed that out yet, um, but in my mind, they would um, like change slightly in elevation between like, uh, you know, being ground plane, but also then being raised at times, but not like super drastically, just subtly. Um, and then in the moments walking over the water bodies, it would sort of transition material. So I, I unfortunately didn't quite get there in terms of uh, where I'm at at this moment, but it's, def it's definitely been a consideration in the way I've imagined the journey. Um, I just I hadn't gotten there quite yet, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I, Evan had mentioned at one point the desire, I think, for larger events, and maybe your project is more introspective and is focused more on the kind of intimate experience, but that could be an opportunity for your, for your paths to kind of thicken and thin and, um, really push the experience that you're directing. Um, and I think that yours in particular is is asking to be like very tactile in terms of the sounds um, and the feeling and, and maybe those moments where you cross the water, it's a great so you can really kind of look down. I think the, you know, in, in yours, it seems like there would be a lot of looking down as much as there is looking out. Um, mm -hmm. And so those those materials seem to be really important consideration. Okay. One of the things I've been thinking about with these trails, I mean, the, the distance is, is considerable. Um, and, and having been out far from the farmstead itself and having a storm come up, um, you know, some sort of shelter along the way, you know, something to consider. Um, and maybe, um, you know, we'll have people that'll come to the farm and, and spend a short amount of time. And there's a very limited number of things that they can see. And so they, they might see the farmstead and the closest pond and, and that's it. Um, other people who might be there for a longer period of time, we can get out in the mule and we can go out and look at all the sort of the four corners of the property. And that maybe, you know, one of those, one of the loops might be tighter that might be walking and for like a shorter time, there might be an intermediate trail like the next one out is maybe for bikes or horseback and then the furthest one out is is, is more maybe for an ATV type of vehicle and that where they cross over those creeks, maybe they share a bridge and they intersect and then maybe go off and like crisscross, you know, like um, I don't know, uh, but I think that, um, you know, how those, those loops are used by different people um, for different purposes um, might need to be thought out a little bit more because um, otherwise they're sort of, they're, they're sort of the same um, because they're basically going through the same landscapes at the same point in time. 
you know, if you, if three people were to leave from the same place on the three different, uh, it's like they'd end up at, they'd be in the same place at the same time, but just like socially distant. Um, and then I would, I would say too, like I, when I was looking at the, the Hopewell image, uh, the cemetery image, uh, which is the, one of those slides. Um, yes. That one. Now, are those are those three lines parallel trails going through that landscape? Yeah. So uh, there are three three moments on the path that are parallel to one another. But um, the intention is to explore that area several times, and mm -hmm. uh, that that specific area is given the most sort of trail time and and time spent in there. And and that intention behind that was to give a level of importance to that area over um, other spaces, um, but not, in, but I didn't want it to necessarily be like extraordinarily, you know, like in your face, but you just keep encountering the space. And every time you do, it's um, another moment to reflect on what, why that, that area was important. So that's, that's actually why there's that repeated walkthrough of a few, of a few different places, because I wanted, if, if you did take that longer path, um, I wanted a person to re-experience the same thing several times because mm -hmm. it's a different on the journey for them. Um, so maybe the first time they walk through Hopewell, they're like, oh, what is this? And then by the time they've reached it again, they might have reached a different point in their understanding of the site or their appreciation of the site. And then the third time they might be in a completely different space as well. Um, so yeah, it's just supposed to be sort of like a, a contemplative experience, less so mm -hmm. like an active recreational experience. It's an interesting contrast to where we just ended the last discussion about sort of the light touch and maybe even not having anyone go through it. Mm -hmm. you know, and here we have kind of parallel pathways through. But yeah. what if what if the what if the cemetery interrupted those paths? Um, you know, like a sort of confounded the the trajectory mm. so that when you come up to it all of a sudden you're you're having to um, to to walk the circumference or something, you know, and then you get back on your your route on the other side, or you you know, or or jump on one of the one of the adjacent um, loops, because I think mm -hmm. there there is a way in which like the like a trail seems like it should be subservient mm -hmm. to the cemetery, yeah, not the other way around. Okay, and I think. I don't know that we've talked about that this in other projects, but that is such an important consideration imagining the repeat visit, um, imagining how someone keeps returning to a place um, and having a new experience or a new understanding based on having grown and, you know, been impacted from their previous visit. And that's something that, um, I guess it is kind of built into the the cemetery module or this memorial idea is that you do continue to build your relationship with that place in a um, in a repetitive way. So I think it's really interesting here how you've thought about that um, and how it's a slightly nuanced perspective on each new visit. It's, it's really interesting to think about. Yeah, I, I think it also, but it, it raises a design question for further investigation of how do you signal, how do we know that we've been here before and, and what are the signals that you as a designer are showing that, you know, the path adjacent and parallel is the one that you were just on and now this is a different view of the same place. Like um, those are each, I mean, it's such an interesting design problem that you've set up for yourself. Um, but I would just interrogate that further. Is it a planting regime? Is it an artifact? Is it, you know, how do you make sure that the re-experiencing is having the layered impact that you intend? Well, and, or, or is it, is that the intent? I mean, I think like when we, when we were walking through, um, 
the southern portion of the site when when we visited as a class um i was so turned around you know i i just felt completely lost um and i think that that landscape until you know it um by virtue of having been there a lot like evan has um and walked it a lot um it is uh you know, the, the features are hard to read. There is a kind of continuity aside from the creeks and even the creeks, like they twist and turn so much that it's hard to determine your directionality in reference to them. So I, that's why I think I kind of really liked this idea that you might, you might be traversing a place very close to where you were, but you, it, it's really like you're providing people a meditative experience, a chance to be lost. Um, in this landscape. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, it's a romantic, it's a romantic idea. Um, and it's a conceptual idea. And I think that um, to make it to legitimize it, I would say like, okay, can you do all of the practical things, right? <laughs> like all of the things that Evan's seeking, and still maintain this kind of like conceptual experience of the landscape? you know, for the person who wants to go to the cemetery and come back, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they just take the same path. They just turn around and go back. That That's an easy one. But, you know, <laughs> could you <laughs> could you sort of like field all of the practical needs and then still have this, this other kind of, um, I don't know, um, more conceptual experience? Mm -hmm. Right, because you want the complexity built into the experience, not into like confusion, like where did I park my car, right? <laughs> Evan, I. I think that's. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, this is Jane. I was just going to say, I think it's a very cool conceptual idea. And I think that you could actually take it further by um, playing with height a little bit on your paths, maybe taking some things higher, some things mm. lower. You could really make it an interesting experience by, by playing with that uh, beyond just playing with materials. Thank you. Any other last comments? Okay, well, thank, thank you, Bridget. Yeah, thank you, everyone. That was really great. I appreciate it. Um, before we close, um, I'm just wondering if the critics have any thoughts um, overall. Um, Evan, you've been with us since the morning. And um, for those of you who have just been for this session, um, any kind of overarching um, comments you'd like to make about the studio or the work? One, I just want to want to thank you, um, all of you, for your involvement, for your engagement, for coming out there and taking the time to experience the site, think about it. Um, you know, it, to me, what's exciting is to always see these new ideas that that come out of of, of different sets of eyes um, on a place that. Um, in some ways has become um, um, that I've gotten used to, but when I see it with new people, um, it, it's new again and it's very interesting and we're so grateful. I think on behalf of our, our board and our committee and our, and, and, you know, and, and Jane as well, I'm glad she was able to join us this afternoon on her trip. Um, but uh, to have the engagement of, of, of your program and, and Phoebe, the leadership that you provided the students and what was really, an, an extraordinary semester with a pandemic that we're still able to sit here and, and spend the day looking at these really interesting uh, ideas. Um, and I think collectively, uh, you have touched on, on, on really everything that, that has come up in the last six years, um, not necessarily on any one plan, but, but collectively you've touched on and everything from the cemetery to, you know, where we have this sacred place to remember the lives of, of, of runaway slaves who are emancipated to, you know, how we can have, you know, holistic grazing and, and minimize um, 
the impacts of you know you know armadillos. I mean, the site just covers so much, um, and we've touched on so much. And I appreciate the creativity. And uh, as the person who has to sort of the lead the charge to do some very practical and realistic things in a constrained budget, having mowed the lawn myself, um, I'm sensitive to some of the, the sort of the practical aspects, but I love the creative ideas. And I, I really do want to see a lot of these ideas incorporated into our plans um, as we move forward. And, 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 and I hope too that, that while some of you may move on from the site and pursue your own professional careers and in, in, in different places that, um, you know, whether it's in a year or 10 years or even some of you 30 years, 50 years from now, come back and see how this site has changed and, and hopefully see how you have made a difference in the site through your work. So thank you all. I just want to second completely what Evan said. Um, we are so thankful for you guys participating with us and just involving us. Uh, we really love having students and just creativity. You know, it infuses us, it gives us some motivation and some hope. <laughs> and uh, it also helps us see the site through new eyes. So all of your presentations that I saw were amazing. You all did wonderful jobs, great graphics. And um, Phoebe, you've done a wonderful job leading everyone. So thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think I mentioned this earlier, but I I really learned a lot. Um, it's the site is so interesting, and um, it's nice to see there's actually a lot of continuity in the presentations across the board in terms of style, but um, because of the complexities of the site and all the issues, you've kind of been able to find interesting niches and take it in different directions and have completely different kind of perspectives. So um, I, it's really impressive what y'all have achieved. And I think it's so interesting. I would just keep pushing it so that you can, you know, um, keep exploring these ideas and, and beef up your portfolio and all those opportunities. Yeah, I, um, I'm so impressed by uh, the, variety of scales that you all were working at um, and just also seeing the progress that you've made in terms of graphic representation uh, since last semester and even at the midterm. Um, it's really incredible. I hope you all feel proud of what you've um, been able to achieve this semester under some very odd circumstances. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with you all uh, this fall um, in the third studio um, and building on these graphic skills and also thinking at uh, a much larger scale and then bringing that down to the scale of the human body. Um, so it, I, it, this just makes me excited to think, think about the fall um, and what that's gonna look like and how we can build on all of the things that you've been exploring here today. I also um, wanna thank you because I, I really learned a lot um, in terms of uh, technical questions of regenerative uh, landscapes, and then also just thinking about the history of Texas. So bringing that alive through your design proposals and um, developing really clear ideas in response to a complicated site was really inspiring. So thanks so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, reviewers. And thank you, especially um, Evan and Jane for making this possible, for inviting us to um, take a look at Bassett Farms, which is such an extraordinary um, piece of land um, and um, history. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I just feel so grateful that, um, that this happened um, and that, that we, the, the students were able to, um, to learn about Bassett Farms and to put forth some ideas. Um, and you all have been so generous um, welcoming, welcoming us um, in and providing this opportunity. So, um, and also just so insightful. I'm just, I'm so impressed, Evan and Jane, by your 
like I, I kept thinking they must have gone to design school at some point <laughs> because uh, you know you really have um, an amazing intuition and um, kind of knowledge of landscape and understanding of um, of the land and um, of the importance of the the kind of hybridity of that site. Um, you know, all of these different aspects overlaying and, and coming together, it's very complex, um, but that's what makes it such a rich and uh, meaningful place. Um, so thank you and thank you students. It's been a great semester. I can't believe what you've achieved. Um, I, I just, um, you're so smart and talented and um, yeah, and here we are. Um, and you'll move forward um, over the summer and the fall, um, you know, as if there was never a pandemic <laughs> <laughs> uh, to slow you down. Um, so congratulations and, and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, I also can't believe what I achieved. This is <laughs> thank you, Phoebe. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great. All right, wonderful. Well, everyone have a great evening. Go out and celebrate. Um, Stay in and celebrate. <laughs> I will go out to my front porch and celebrate. <laughs> great. <laughs> celebrate with sleep. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks. Everybody. Bye.